Hello, um, I'm Sean Harrington, the Chief Executive of Fulham Palace Trust. Uh, a warm welcome to our talks tent for our on-site visitors and also those watching online. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'd like to thank all our fantastic speakers for attending today. Thanks also to Paul BT Pownall from um, Chair of the Hammersmith and Fulham Climate and Ecological Commission Emergency, um, Emergency Commission and our chair today. Um, the 13-acre site of Fulham Palace that you see today is a remnant of a once extensive country estate on the banks of the River Thames, stretching from Chiswick to the west to Chelsea in the east and to Wilsdon in the north. It was owned by the Bishops of London from 704 till 1974 and was his country house from the 14th century. The palace has been a home, a farm, a manorial court, a banqueting house, a hospital and offices and now a visitor attraction. I believe that our story of survival and reinvention is an inspiration for what we must do in the future to not only preserve the palace but to save the planet for future generations. Over the past 15 years, the restoration of Fulham Palace has delivered within this green oasis a museum, a cafe, a shop, an education centre, a wedding and events venue, residential accommodation and commercial office space. The income that we're able to generate from these sources enables us to provide free access to the garden 365 days per annum. In the garden we've reintroduced plant varieties first grown at the palace over 300 years ago many for the first time in the UK and even Europe, established a volunteer-run beekeeping program and planted the wall garden where we grow organic fruit, flowers and vegetables for sale on our market barrow. Alongside this, our learning and engagement program provides opportunities for involvement for many different audiences and volunteers. The result is a freely accessible green lung in the heart of London, helping to ta tackle nature deficit for people living in the city. But the palace is not yet as green as it could be, and there is more to, that we can and must do. Fulham Palace Trust is committed to reduce our own environmental and pollution footprint, increase biodiversity and inspire others to do the same. Our first ever green meet, celebrating World Earth Day, is being held today, and our focus this year is on biodiversity, ecology, access and activism. This talk session will run until about 3.35. Our first section now focuses on the palace and it will run until three, um, until one, <laughs> get my words out, um, until 1.35 and there will be a 10 minute break before a 70 minute session with seven guest speakers running until 2.55. Then we'll have another break and then we've got a Q&A session um, running until 3.35. Uh, so I, without further ado, I'll hand over to the first speaker in this slot, which is Dr. Mark Spencer. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much, Sean, for inviting me to speak here and to the trustees, Fulham Palace, and members of the local community here. Um, I have to say, Fulham Palace has definitely one of London's special secret jewels, and the first time I came here... About 10 years ago, I was blown away by its charms because it has so much to offer. One of the things we all love about London is the layers of history. In fact, actually, yesterday I was walking around one of my other favourite pieces of London landscape, which is Crayford Marsh in south-east London, which is so profoundly different. Again, like this, it has a history of sort of layers of London's history, human activity, and the natural environment responding to that. And this space, like Crayford Marsh, is incredibly important to London's cultural history as well as to London's natural history and its biodiversity. So the reason I'm really here initially, or was really here initially, was because I used to work for the Natural History Museum. My job is and was as a botanist. I am somewhat passionate about plants. I've studied them since I was a small boy. And for me, they are really the most exciting and interesting thing on the planet. Um, and through my life, both personally and professionally, I've worked with plants pretty much non-stop, apart from a brief period when I was a personnel officer. Um, now, the reason I'm really here was because during my time at the Natural History Museum, we're incredibly lucky in that organisation to have about 80 million objects of natural history specimens collected from all over the world, some of which actually hail from here, 
from the personal collections of Bishop Compton. And Bishop Compton is a fascinating man because he's incredibly important in the history of this place, the history of the bishops of London in their own right, and the history of our nations and the development of our societies today. Because without him, in part, the Glorious Revolution wouldn't have occurred and we wouldn't have had William and Mary on the throne. But the secret bit of the bishop's life for many people was his avid enthusiasm for collecting plants. Um, now, he wasn't much of a field natural historian himself. He was obviously a man of wealth and power. So he used that reach, which was almost global in many respects for the period, to send people out, particularly to North America, where he was the bishop as well, to collect plants for him. And in his life, he collected some 1,000 different types of plant, which is an extraordinary quantity for any garden at any time. But if you imagine the late 17th, early 18th century, most gardens, if they existed, in them, would probably have 10, 20, 30, 40 things in it. They would be a very small amount. It would be very utilitarian. The bishop was growing plants for joy, pleasure, grandiose statements of his power as a bishop, but also natural history curiosity. He grew exotica from South Africa, from North America and other parts of the world. So he was actually one of the most adventurous early botanist gardeners in our history of horticulture. So he grew really very, very exciting things like some of the first pelagoniums, the mainstay of our hanging baskets and gardens today. He's one of the first people in this country to grow them. He also had a delightful personal sort of connection with these plants. Our research has shown that, amongst other things, he had a fondness for ginger. He may well have been the first person in Britain, as we know, to grow ginger in his glass houses just here. He had very early, and we still don't know very much about them, glass houses. He also had a taste for the rather unusual. It's fair to say us Englishmen generally, globally, have got this reputation for being somewhat scared of such unusual food. The bishop was not like that. So he had on upon his salads, he had scattered flowers of the East American rosebud tree. He also had a fondness for guinea pepper, chili pepper, and he would scatter the raw seeds onto his, onto his food. So he was quite an adventurous and extraordinary chap in all sorts of ways. So that piece of research, along with working with the people here, has helped us deliver the um, Compton bed. And now we're moving on, as I'm participating, in actually delivering and hopefully exploring the park and the sites natural history wonder. So I've been collecting botany records for the last 300 years so we understand what grew here in the past and what we can do here in the future. Because when we are planning in this world of change, climate change, we need to understand what was in the landscape before. So if you are thinking, what can I do in my garden? What should I be doing in my council? What should we be doing in England? We should resist the urge as human beings, because this is what's already got us into this problem, of leaping in and going, there's the solution. Do this, do that. We need to step back and think carefully when it comes to planning mitigation and what things we should be planting in our landscape for the future. We do need to take action, though. It is fair to say that you will be hard-pressed to find a climate scientist or a natural historian such as myself who is not deeply, deeply concerned. This is truly a global emergency, and all of us and small spaces such as this are a really important part of that. And particularly as the modern world changes, it's fair to say many of us are more and more divorced from the wider countryside. This is our countryside. These plants are immensely important to our aesthetic, cultural and well-being into the future. So we need to preserve them, guard them and work into the future to ensure that we can deliver a Fulham Palace, which is rich and wonderful and will be here for another thousand years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, now I'd like to introduce Lucy Hart, who's the head gardener at Fulham Palace, to talk about all the work that we've been doing and are planning to do. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, and thanks, everybody, for um, coming today. Um, 
this is really exciting. This is our first green meet, and um, it's just such an amazing opportunity to be able to shout out about all the um, environmentally friendly, sustainable things that we're doing. Um, so I really appreciate you you coming and listening um, to the talks today. Um, I've been head gardener here for 10 years now. Sean and I have both been here for 10 years, and um, I don't know where that time has gone, I've got to be honest with you. Um, it's been, I mean, I think we have to say there's never been a dull moment here at Fulham Palace, um, but um, it's... Um, it's a, a brilliant a brilliant place um we have um a, a wonderful team and we've been able to put on something like this right in you know hopefully near the end of this pandemic but um i'm just really grateful for everyone's hard work for for helping it to to become a success um it is an absolute privilege to be a head gardener here at fulham palace um i've got to work with some many amazing people and um uh, done lots of wonderful things. Um, we have a team in the garden of five staff. Um, we have three garden apprentices and we've been running an apprenticeship since 2012. Many of those apprentices have gone off to do some fantastic things. And um, I have 60 garden volunteers um, and you may have met quite a few of them who are running stalls out here now. And so, you know, these guys are just incredible. They're very dedicated and committed to Fulham Palace. And without them, alongside all our other volunteers, because we have 250 across the whole of the organisation, um, we wouldn't be able, been able to have achieve um, any of this. So I'm really grateful for those as well. But I'm going to talk to you today about um, uh, Fulham Palace and um, uh, why um, and what we do here at Fulham Palace. It's green. Um, can you see the PowerPoint? Oh, there we are. Okay. Um, so you're clicking it, are you? Okay, I got you. Oh, I do it. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so the grass is greener at Fulham Palace. And of course, I'm not talking about the colour, um, because if you'd come here last year when we, we were in drought, it was bleached white. <laughs> but um, it is greener in a biodiverse way, um, and that's what we're, we're all about. So, um, oh, there we go. So, um, the images on the right show um, some flowers. Um, we have um, Achillea um, in the white, the white flowering there, and um, some buttercups. And so we have um, a mowing regime where we keep grass areas long and we mow around areas where there's flowering just so we can have some food for pollinators and for other insects throughout the year. Um, and one of our best sort of um, success stories really is the management of the moat. So if you came in from the main gate up there, um, there is a stretch of our one-mile moat. That, that w sorry, there's a part of our one-mile moat. Once it went around all the sites, it was one mile long, um, but part of that was excavated in 2010 and um, to demonstrate where the moat was. And um, I arrived in 2011 and they had just grass seeded it. And um, since then we've been managing it as a wildflower meadow, so cutting it once and then removing the vegetation and we've been doing this every year. Admittedly, uh, when I first arrived, because the way they dug it, it was so steep, we could only cut it once because it was so difficult. Um, I did try um, scything it. We did a course on scything. We did talk about goats, whether that would keep the grass down. But actually, what, um, the way we cut it now is um, we have a great volunteer group called... Um, uh, good Jim, and they have been coming in on Saturdays. Um, they want to help community projects and get fit at the same time. So, like running up and down a very steep slope is right up their street and cutting things. Um, so, that's how we've been able to keep the moat maintained. We cut it once at the end of summer, remove the vegetation, and by doing that, and doing that for 10 years, it started to, um, some native species have started to come back. And Mark has surveyed that area. Um, and he's really excited about some of the things that he's seen there. And um, it, it is some, a rare mint uh, variety. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think one of the things that's been really exciting about it is in many ways you look at some of the lawns here and they look like there's, there's nothing left after a thousand years of really intense human activity. But the re-exposure of the original profile of the moat 
we've had several regionally scarce and rare plants for London reappear. So there's this wonderful thing called Ditanda, which once upon a, use, a time used to be one of our primary flavouring foods before we got terribly modern. That has reappeared. It's a scarce plant in parts of inner London. We have um, a, a very, very nice the Bascom, a mullein, which is nationally quite common, but really, really rare in North London. And most exciting of all, a delightful member of the mint family called a clinopodium or calamint, which is also, frankly, on the brink of extinction in London. So this simple act of taking back to the original soil level and reducing nutrients that Lucy and her team are doing has been incredibly important for the management and the improvement of the biodiversity because all of those plants are incredibly valuable for pollinator insects. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, we're in good hands with Mark, as you can see. Um, <laughs> so... Um, that's the management of some areas. We've been enhancing other uh, lawn areas. Um, we, the orchard bit over there, um, we, we let grow long every year. And um, I sowed um, Ryananthus, um, the yellow rattle plant, um, probably about six years ago. We've got a really great population of that now. And this is a parasitic plant, so it parasitize, parasitizes grasses and reduces their vigor, doesn't kill them. Um, but it just allows other species to come in. So, by, you know, and with it spreading each year, it's allowing different um, wildflowers to come in. We've also oversown that, and we've planted plugs along here as well. So, it's just every year we try and do something to in, um, increase our uh, diversity out on the lawns. Um, so, as part of our Phase 3 Heritage Lottery project, we... Um, did a big community plant of bulbs just outside. It's the tail end of them out there now. And um, we wanted something to highlight and to make that area, you know, more interesting in spring. But it wasn't just about that. It was about bringing in some early uh, flowers for pollinators. So um, I chose varieties that were good for pollinators. And the moat, uh, there's one bit which rep represents the moat. It um, has five different blue types of bulbs. So it was all about bringing in more plant diversity and sort of upping our plant range here on site. And about that time when they're in flower, we're working in the woodland here. So it is a small wooded area. Um, and I was delighted to inherit a load of um, hazel, hazel plants. So each year, and we've been doing this um, for 10 years, we coppice um, the hazel. I work on a kind of five to eight year cycle. Um, and by coppicing, so the image on the left is all the volunteers here helping us do it. It was a lot of fun. Um, we, we are completely changing the environment for that part of the woodland. We're completely cutting down the plant, opening up to light from the woodland floor, allowing new species to come in, bluebells and primroses perhaps. And then as the coppice hazel grows up, again it changes and allows other insects and um, species to come in. So it's all about kind of changing. It's an old woodland, um, ancient woodland practice, of course. And this is very small scale, we know, you know, we know that, but we, we, we manage, we're doing the same principles. Um, and the icing on the cake is we get to keep the brushwood, so anything we coppice, um, we then use to support our peas, and our, uh, um, we make wigwams in the veg garden, and we use for uh, making brushwood baskets, um, as you can see um, on the left there, um, to support herbaceous plants to grow through without having to use string. So, um, moving down a bit in the woodland, um, we did clear um, some space to make room for the Compton beds, as what Mark was talking about. So, to bring in loads, uh, um, to replant lots of species that are growing here, again, to up our biodiversity. Um, but by doing that, we needed to thin our woodland out because um, having, it hadn't been let, left for a few years. It was, um, sycamore had become quite invasive. Not that there's anything wrong with sycamore, it does support a lot of species. However, there were too many of them and they were too close together. 
So we thin we thin some of those out. Um, uh, we made an informed decision, but we did uh, look after our elms and ash plant and uh, ash trees. Of course, elm has succumbed to um, Dutch elm disease in the 70s, but we still have some very young specimens here growing, and we let them grow to see whether or not they will um, manage to mature. Often they don't, and they die. And any dead wood, we will keep on site. We'll make log piles or try and keep as much of the dead tree up as possible for invertebrates to to to, to live in. Um, and of course. Sadly, with ash dieback, which came in in 2012, um, the same with our ash trees as well. We've been monitoring them for dieback for the for the fungal disease, and um, again, keep any dead wood on site where we where we or keep the wood the, the tree up itself. So um, we grow vegetables here, and um, you know, life is great growing your own. It's um, a wonderful thing, and I think during lockdown, lots of more people have got interested in this, which is great. Um, for us, it's a really good opportunity for the apprentices to learn about growing vegetables. Um, and also, um, we use no-dig principles, so we want to preserve the soil. We want to try and keep its um, natural structure without digging it as much uh, as, as much as possible. Um, we mulch and um, we use cultural techniques such as um, on the slide, you can see the, the, the um, carrots are... Um, surrounded by mesh, which is to stop the carrot fly coming in. And these are all old practices that allotmenteers use. It's not new. So being green and being sustainable as a gardener, it, it can be very easy because all the, um, you know, the, the techniques are there already. Um, sorry, I've... Um, where's the wrong thing? Sorry. <laughs> Um, but of course it enables us to sell our produce and we sell um, the, the produce on the barrow along with the preserves and we have um, volunteers who've had their kitchens checked out by the council to make um, chutneys and preserves at home to bring it in to sell here. Um, we also supply our cafe. But this income is vital. It's a vital source of income for us um, at Fulham Palace. We are free, open seven days a week, free of charge for everybody. And so by supporting our barrow, it really helps us to um, maintain the garden. So thank you very much for that. Um, so we use organic techniques, of course, throughout, and on the image there we use a lot of marigolds, lots of companion planting, marigolds and other plants, um, onions, um, lavender, they confuse pests and they, 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 um, they, they, they try and ward them off, all the good plants that we want to keep um, are unscathed. Um, we have netting to stop uh, the, butter, the cabbage white coming in, and we use cardboard um, collars to stop cabbage root fly from set laying its eggs in the cabbages. Um, you can see there's an image of a, an insect there, so that's a biocontrol. We used um, predat predatory and parasitic mites and wasps to hunt out uh, bad pests in the, in the vinery and uh, basically do, do the deed for us. Um, so it's great. We get live um, uh, deliveries of insects um, every few weeks. And um, the biocontrols doesn't stop there. We actually um, have, you may have noticed on the orchard, these little green bags. So this is lacewing larvae that um, we put in. Um, we've got to be careful, not too many, because if there's too many and not enough um, rose apple aphid, which unfortunately the orchard has, um, they are carnivores, so they will eat each other. So we have to be careful with that. Um, and fruit trees, generally, we've planted over 120 fruit trees since I've been here, um, around the walls, on the arch, and in the orchard. Um, so it's just so great to be able to see all these trees growing now um, successfully. Um, of course, I can't not talk about compost. Um, I put a compost unit in when I first started. It, it, it's just the answer to everything, actually. It gets rid of your garden waste, and it gives you mulch back. It's just win-win. And we have leaf mold piles, and we have just separate grass clipping compost as well. So we use everything. Um, we're peat-free, of course, so all the plants that we're selling on our barrow over there are all grown with peat-free compost, using our own leaf mould in the mix as well. Um, and just, again, thanks to the volunteers, because there was a time when we, we would um, cut up milk bottles um, for plant labels, and they were experts at making it the right length with the right 
point and all this but we've gone to wooden labels now but um, you know it's just really sort of thinking about all these things that you can do in order to um, recycle and to um, uh, be sustainable so um, as Sean said there's you know there's still more stuff for us to do there always is um, and with you know thinking about how we can conserve water we collect water on an underground tank from the vinery roof and the bothies which we use but Perhaps there is an opportunity to collect water from the palace roof and have water butts around. Um, we're looking into uh, more electric bat battery run uh, machinery when it becomes available um, and when we need new machinery we'll be getting those. Um, and also we don't have um, any water habitats here at Fulham Palace yet. There may be an ambition to fill the moat in, that would be amazing. But for now we're build, building ponds and you can see Pete has been building a couple of just small barrels because we can't go dig down because the ancient scheduled monumenting. So we'll go up. So we're going to have these two barrels that he's made out on site and it will be a nice um, source of water for birds and other, other uh, wildlife. Um, so... Um, that's it. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the talks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. We've now got um, a 10-minute break, and then we'll be carrying on with the rest of the, the talks um, in 10 minutes' time, so don't miss them. They'll be great. Thank you.
uh, session, which is uh, seven um, ten-minute talks by various experts. And first of all, I'd like to introduce Russell Miller, who um, works with the Tree Musketeers in Hackney, um, who will be talking about sustainable, thoughtful tree planting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, great to be here. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, sustainable tree planting. Who would have thought there could be anything other than sustainable tree planting? Surely tree planting is always sustainable, isn't it? That's, that's the thing. Um, alas, it's not quite so simple. Um, oh, I've jumped miles ahead. Let's go back. So... Are people seeing? I'm, I'm, I'm seeing changes. No, uh, yep. Um, yep. Okay. So, uh, to tree or not to tree? Um, that is the question these days because there's an awful lot of um, enthusiasm in tree planting, and that's great. It's great that people want to plant trees, but trees are not going to save us. Um, trees are not going to stop climate change. Trees are not going to solve biodiversity problems. Um, they may be part of an answer, but if you are serious about dealing with climate change, you need to reduce fossil fuel emissions and you need to do a whole lot more than just plant a tree or plant thousands of trees or plant millions of trees or plant billions of trees. Um, that's not the solution. Um, so a couple of scientific papers there pointing out some of the problems with tree planting, um, including a kind of tree planting imperialism whereby basically rich countries plant trees in poor countries and pretend that's how they've dealt with their carbon problem and usually in the process they trash the biodiversity in the poor country. Um, so uh, it's not just a problem in uh, other countries because uh, there's a peat bog being dug up by the Forestry Commission um, and this is a little bit unfair because the Forestry Commission as they describe themselves are big and ugly enough to take all the criticism but there are plenty of other people I could point that criticism at including some national big um, tree planting charities. Uh, basically there's a lot of money around tree planting at the moment and you need to be really careful to make sure that you're planting the right tree in the right place for the right reasons rather than planting lots of trees anywhere because you've got money. Um, so it's a bit of a negative story uh, in a way, but I will get back to some positives around tree planting. But it's a really important message that tree planting is more complicated than some of the narratives. Um, Oliver Rackham famously said that um, if you are planting trees, you've already failed, because really you should be thinking about natural regeneration. Uh, if you've, particularly if you're talking about a large area, if you're talking about wilding, if you're talking about opportunities for creating new woodland, essentially leave it alone and let it, nature get on with it. Um, there are very definitely opportunities where you can plant and where that's very useful but if there is an opportunity for natural regeneration that is much much better uh, there are lots of reasons why that's much better you'll get more carbon sequestration you'll get better biodiversity you'll get better trees um, and you'll get much greater resilience so if you can let nature do it for you in addition we need to look after the trees that we've got rather than let them die and plant a load of new ones um, I know it kind of all sounds a bit obvious, but unfortunately the resources are not there to look after the trees that we've got, but the resources are there to plant loads of trees. So local authorities have massive cutbacks over the years. They don't have the tree officers, they don't have the teams available to manage their old trees. Um, and old trees are fantastically more important than new trees because they're better at storing carbon, they're better at all the ecosystem services, flood all alleviation, they provide more shade. Um, and they're also genetically important uh, resources. So if you can support local authority tree officers or tree owners to maintain their existing tree stocks. But it's OK, you can plant some trees. Um, so uh, there are reasons why you would, you would plant trees. Natural regeneration doesn't work in certain situations. So if you want a new street tree in your street, the chances of the right tree growing in the right place um, are pretty remote. So there's, there's a lots of reasons why you might want to plant a tree. Um, and that's all good if you're planting it in the right place. Um, but bear in mind, tree planting isn't natural. You're moving a thing to a place where it wasn't before. As a planting shock, there's all sorts of issues of soil disturbance, root loss, competition from other vegetation so it needs a bit of thinking about and a bit of planning uh, planning is one of the key things i would suggest in relation to trees right tree right place really nice simple set statement 
and it's a really good guide for whether or not your tree planting is appropriate. What's the species that you're thinking of planting? Um, when are you thinking of planting it? What sort of size of tree are, th are you thinking of planting? Um, and if, you, if you're looking at all those issues, then the chances are you're more likely to get it right. I'm rattling through a little bit because I've only got 10 minutes. Um, uh, so let's just jump to this one. Okay, now, if you're going to plant a tree, do you want it to live? Probably, hopefully, not always. Um, is that going to work? Yes, it is. Okay, red circle, white circle. That's a little seedling grown naturally. Red circle is about the same size as white circle. So in other words, the crown and the roots are in balance. Buy a big standard from a nursery and you've got a big crown and a little root system. That's why when you plant a tree, you've got to go back and water it. Or if you plant a big tree, you've got to go back and water it because your crown and your roots are out of balance. So I don't really have time to go through all the complexities of planting trees, but what's amazing is no one really teaches tree planting. Or if they do teach tree planting, it generally consists of taking a tree, digging a hole and putting it in, uh, rather than actually any of the theory and any of the complexity around it. So I talk about root to crown ratios, what I just showed you there, root to crown ratio. Is it one to one, which is good, or is it one to lots, which is less good? Um, if you're gonna plant whips, small trees, and you might plant a lot of them, you might have a one-to-one -one root to crown ratio, so you wouldn't necessarily go back and water that tree, but what you have got to do is think about the competition. You stick a bunch of trees in existing grass, the grass is already there, the grass has got all its root systems already established, the tree's new, it's lost a lot of its roots in terms of its fine hair roots, which do all the work um, during the, the transplantation process, and as a result, it's going to not compete well against the grass so you need to mulch it and that's really what we do with tree musketeers we kind of we plant we take care and uh, we engage people in thoughtful long-term tree planting we don't aim to plant everything all in one year we aim to do it over a very long period and the key final piece of the jigsaw is the aftercare you're mulching to reduce water loss so you don't have to use a load of water um, you mulch as soon as you get bud burst if you do have to use guards, and you may have to use guards if you've got um, issues with mowers or uh, vandalism or dogs. Um, and really, that's where the key part comes in. It's not the planting day. The planting day is great, but it's what happens after. If you forget, that's what happens. Perfectly well-planted, heavy standard tree, but no one went back and watered it. Or if they did, they didn't go back frequently enough. Um, so, yeah. Tree planting is great, but it's not the solution to everything. And if you're going to do it, get some advice. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Russell. Uh, the next speaker is Mark Patterson, who is coming to talk to us about bees, the huge range of uh, species of bees, and uh, some of the issues that they're facing in London um, at the moment. Afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to start off my talk with a bit of a brief introduction to bees more broadly in the UK, the different types of species, um, how they live, where you find them, things like that. I'm then going to talk a little bit about um, some of the bee species that you can find at Fulham Palace um, that I've recorded over the years uh, during, my, during my involvement with the Palace Trust. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the honeybees and why honeybees were brought back to the palace and the sort of benefits and the successes that they've, they've had with the, the honeybee project here. So we've got, in the UK, we've got um, about 278 species of bees. The exact sort of number of species that we have fluctuates, it goes up and down. Every now and again, we lose a species, a species goes extinct. But for every species that goes extinct, we 
periodically gather a new gain a new species because bees are not sort of static creatures they move around a lot and we've constantly got new species coming in and colonizing from the continent so the the number of species we have does fluctuate a little bit um of those 270 odd species 26 of them are bumblebees these are the big fat fluffy bumblebee bees that you'll see in your garden so the most common one that you see is uh, the black and yellow bees with the white tails they're the buff tailed bumblebees um, and then we have one species of honeybee and the honeybee varies a lot in shape size and color because there's lots of subspaces and a lot of genetic variation within the species but they're all the same species they're all western honeybees and all of the other bees that we have in the UK are solitary bees so these are all um, these are not social bees they don't nest in the big colonies they all live on their own um, they're basically sort of single parents they have you know small small nest raise a small brood of offspring and um, they don't live in a big colony and on this slide here we have these are some of the bees that you can find in Fulham Palace so the top left we've got the uh, tawny mining bee and then we've got uh, on the top middle we've got a Lassia glossum and then we've got another Andrina bee I think that one's a is it grey patch I think I can't see the patches on it and then we've got um, some cuckoo bees. These are small parasitic bees that um, prey on. They, they so basically behave like a cuckoo bird. They sneak their eggs into nests of other bees, and they often parasitize the Andrina mining bees. In the middle, we've got a honey bee. The bottom, we've got uh, an Andrina labiata, the red girdle minor bee, which is a nationally scarce species that you find in the palace grounds. And then um, we've got a, a bumblebee in the bottom left, and the sort of middle. Um, the bee on the blue flower, I think it's a yellow-faced bee. I can't remember what I put on, but I think it's a yellow-faced bee. That just gives you an idea of, sort of some of the different species, the variation, the different sizes and colours um, and amounts of hair that bees have on them. Um, so bees live in various different places. Um, oh, hang on. Is that, oh, yes, I thought, I thought I jumped ahead on the slides. I've got a different slide on here that I've got on here. It's confusing. So the majority, majority of our of our wild bees are solitary bees and the vast majority of those nest underground they build burrows in in the ground um often in well trodden on scruffy lawns um sometimes it's on the edge of footpaths in sort of very compacted sandy conditions they might nest in river banks and um scar banks things like that some of them will nest in brickwork and nest in old old stone walls uh, like the walls we have in the palace grounds um, and you would even find them nesting in cracks in the sand in between paving slabs in towns and cities. So they can nest in kind of quite a wide variety of places. Um, some of them will nest inside hollow plant stems. So one of the, the bees that we get in the palace, well, close by the palace, I've not found it in the palace, but you get it up the road in Fulham Cemetery, Mogarine Cemetery, is the small blue carpenter bee, which nests in hollow bramble stems. So there's lots of species that nest in hollow, bra uh, hollow stems, like elder and bramble and... Um, herbaceous perennial plants like cow parsley and things like that. And um, a few of the species of bees nest in tree hollows. So you've got things like the tree bumblebee, which will nest in all bird nests and woodpecker cavities in, in trees. And also um, th things like forktail flower bee, which actually excavates its own burrows in rotting tree stumps. They burrow into rotting tree stumps and make their own nests in rotting tree stumps. And if you look at bumblebees, bumblebees are colony net or a colony organism so they have a small small uh, colony typically 50 to 250 workers and a lot of the bumblebees nest in old wooden burrows underground but a few of them nest uh, under tussocks of grass so they like areas where they've got um, lots of flowers but they also have tall rank grassy areas where they can build their nests under grass tussocks now, like most of our pollinators, um, many of our bee species are in decline. Um, they're facing real hardships in the modern world. Um, I, can't see what I'm, I can't see what I've got on my screen, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry. Is there any way to make that bit bigger on the screen? I can't read what I've got on my slides. I'm having to look over there. The next slide is really big, but it's this one that I actually want to be able to see. I can't actually see the slide. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so of our um, so talking about bee pollinators in decline. So bees, along with lots of other pollinators, are in trouble. We've had lots of bee declines, lots of pollinator declines generally. Um, we've lost 23 species of bee um, since 1850. But like I said, we've gained quite a few species in that time as well. So it's it's not all bad. We've gained species and we've lost species. Um, six out of our 26 bumblebees in the UK are um, are uh, 
threatened. Uh, they're in serious decline. Four of them are considered at risk of extinction. So they're really, really in trouble and need our help. And um, you often see in the media, save the bees slogans and things like this. And often they're aimed at honeybees. And honeybees aren't declined. They're actually increasing in numbers. They don't need any help or assistance at all. They're doing really well. It's the wild bees, it's the bumblebees and soldier bees that need saving. So when we talk about save the bees, we need to ask ourselves, which bees are we referring to? Um, because honeybees are not in trouble, they don't need assistance. Um, and they're actually booking the trend. Honeybees are increasing numbers, so the, the most recent information from DEFRA is, is that there's been a 35% increase in honeybee colony numbers in the UK since 2018. So that's a really big, massive leap in numbers of colonies. And that presents problems for our wild bees, because honeybees, as a managed organism, are competing with wild bees for, for, fl for flowers and for food and for space. So increasing numbers of honeybees has the potential to cause real damage to wild bee populations. Um, a third of our bees, along with wasps and other hymenopterans, are, uh, are in decline uh, and uh, un under serious threat. And it's not just bees that are under threat. The recent uh, report on moths um, highlights that uh, moth numbers in the UK have, have fallen by a third in the last 50 years. So, you know, bees and other pollinators are facing real challenges in the modern world. The reason they're facing these challenges is predominantly habitat loss. Um, an example of habitat loss is if you look at wildflower meadows, we've lost 98% of our wildflower meadows um, since the 1930s. And these are our most important habitats for pollinators. They contain masses of flowers and lots of food resources for pollinators. But we've also seen 50% of our hedgerows grubbed out. And we've just heard from Russell, there's lots of tree planting in, in initiatives and lots of hedge planting initiatives, but they, they don't, they take time to establish in, and we really need to be preserving our more ancient hedges. Um, a lot of the hedges that we've got left are in a poor quality, they're in you know, poor health and condition and can't support the wildlife that they should be. Um, this is all being replaced by millions of hectares of intensive agriculture. We've got increasing use of pesticides. Um, Increasing, increasing dependency on pesticides. The pesticides that we're using are becoming increasingly more toxic as the pest species adapt to the old pesticides and become immune to them. We're developing more and more lethal ways of killing insects. Um, we've also got urban sprawl and development. Our population is growing. We need more space to build houses, roads, schools. This is all takes up habitat that bees and the pollinators depend upon. Um, more recently, we've had concerns about the introduction of exotic pests and diseases. Um, and one of the issues that beekeepers face is, is keeping their bees healthy because there are lots of pests that affect honeybees. But a lot of the honeybee pathogens have the potential to spill over and infect wild pollinators as well. So beekeepers have an important role in protecting wild pollinators um, from exotic pests and diseases by making sure they're treating their bees for varroa mites and keeping pest and pathogen levels in their managed beehives under control so that they don't spill over into wild pollinator populations. Um, the other big problem that we're facing in the modern world is climate change. Climate change is a real threat to, to pollinators. Um, we're already starting to see changing in the timings and the seasons, and, the, and this is disrupting plant and core dependent po uh, pollinator interactions because flowers are emerging earlier, but the bees might not be awake yet, or vice versa. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the wild bees that you find at Fulham Palace. Um, over the years, I've recorded 36 species of uh, bee in the palace grounds. This includes large numbers of ashy mining bee, which nest in the, uh, the front lawn in between the walled garden and the palace over there. So if you're walking across the lawn and you look at the grass, you'll see it's, it's sort of pepper potted with holes, and that's the ashy mining bees nesting in the lawn. Uh, and they're really efficient pollinators of top fruit, so all of the apples, plums, pears, and things that you have in the, in the grounds here, the honeybees are, are, are contributing quite a small amount to the pollination of the fruit trees in, in the grounds. It's the ashy mining bees that are the real sort of heroes of pollination. They're the ones that are pollinating all your, the top fruit. Um, we also get lots of mason bees, hairy foot flower bees, uh, wool carder bees, things like that, nesting in the, in the walls and feeding on the, the, the flowers in the palace grounds. Like I said, we get the nationally rare, nationally scarce red girdled mining bee in the grounds, and I've recorded 11 species of bumblebee, which is quite good considering that only eight of those bumblebee species are common and widespread across the whole country. So 11 bumblebee species in the grounds is quite good. Um, very quick, because I've only got a minute left to talk about honeybees. Um, bees were kept at the palace historically uh, to provide the bishops with honey for sweetener, but also to provide beeswax for candle making, because before electricity, beeswax was highly sought after, 
after is a, is a fuel for lighting. It was favoured over animal uh, fat candles because it, you get a pure bright light and it doesn't produce a lot of smoke and bad smells. So you get a, a, a clean burn on a, on a beeswax candle and as it burns it actually sucks in impurities and cleans the air. Um, so back in the days before air fresheners and you know, cl household cleaning products, beeswax candles were really good for keeping the house smelling nice. Uh, and about 10 years ago, they discovered bee balls in the palace walls. And bee ball, as you can see on the slide here, is a, basically a recess in the, in the walls of the garden where straw beehives called skeps would have been placed. And these would have housed the colonies of honeybees and protected them from the elements. And they would have periodically destroyed the skep to harvest the wax and the honey, but they would have kept some spare skeps to sort of repopulate and start over again the following year. And in 2011, after quite a long absence of managed honeybees on the site, we reintroduced honeybees to the palace, so the hives are just over there on the other side of the wall garden. And um, I came in and I trained up the, some of the palace volunteers and staff into how to look after the honeybees. And um, this is a picture of the, the sort of 2011, 2012 class of students learning about beekeeping. And in 2012, we got our first honey crop, and that went on to win Best London Honey at the National Honey Show, which is the world's biggest honey competition. So that was quite a big success for the palace and um, a big pat on the shoulder for the beekeeping trainees who had put in a lot of hard work looking after the honeybees. Thanks very much to Mark. Um, a reminder to you all, um, after this series of short talks, we have got a Q&A session, so please do um, stay on to ask your questions um, at the end. So our next speaker is um, Dusty Gedge, um, who is the, I think, the Green Roof Guru, um, and he'll be talking about issues for biodiversity in London and um, practical solutions for your own home. So over to Dusty. All right, thank you very much. Uh, this is great because it's the first public talk I've done in 12 months and it's just great to have an audience, you know. Um, I don't do what I'm told, so this is a bit too much about green roofs, but I do get to your house right at the end. I'm just going to... Oh, do we click it like that? Did that work? Did that work? No. I'll click it there then. Um, I was an environmental campaigner. Mark knows me well. I tried to campaign to get a London policy for green roofs, and because of that, I became a president. And I like to say you can't take the punk out of the president because I'm still a little bit of an environmental campaigner, even though I have to represent the green roof industry. We design cities for people. Perhaps we should, and we design the countryside for farming. And I would contend that only nature gets between the cracks. And perhaps what we should do is design the city and the countryside for nature. And I wrote this policy for London, and you won't know, but London is nearly a green roof capital of the world. Since 2008, we put in about 1.7 million square metres of green roofs because of that policy. And I want to tell you why we want to do this in the city. It's not just about biodiversity. Um, we have heat waves. London will be like Barcelona in about 15 years. We're going to love it, but London's not designed for Barcelona. We're getting increased floods, and London suffers from a lot of um, urban flooding. And uh, there you go, there's London. It's going to be as hot as Barcelona, and we're all going to love it, but actually uh, a lot of people will suffer. And so the whole idea of bringing soil and vegetation, and to me, biodiversity into the city, is actually to cool it down, and actually to store the water in the city, stop floods, and actually make our city more bearable for us. And, um, oh, I don't know why that one's there. Oop. And this is Copenhagen in 2012. And I love this picture. This is Bolzano. This woman is seriously, this woman is seriously inconvenienced. And um, this is Lisbon after a five-minute storm in August, old town of Lisbon. And I got involved with it because of a bird called the Black Red Star, which happens to like, on, like living on all those things nobody likes. Derelict power stations, bomb sites, you know, all those things that we don't think of as very, very important for, for nature conservation. We think of, you know, the new forest or whatever. But actually, um, those sites have been claimed to be the Amazon rainforest for our invertebrates in the United Kingdom. It's in the Guardian. I think it comes up in a minute. And so back way back in 1997, I managed to get Lewisham to insist on putting this roof up on the Le Barn Dance Centre. And it's got a lot of very, very interesting rare species. And the important thing for you is something that I know Mark said and I know the Tree Musketeer says. It's about doing things in the right way. And I did this wrong. But then I started collecting seeds locally that grew on concrete. If they grew on concrete, 
I'll put them on my roof. And that is the Lab and Dance Center of me personally seeding it for about six years. And there it is. There's the Amazon jungle. That's, uh, that's a power station out in Essex, which has got more rare species on it than any other bit of land in Essex. But it's a power station. So we wrote all this guidance, and this is actually the guidance that most of the boroughs, um, Hammersmith and Fulham's here, uh, most of the boroughs use in London to get green roofs put up. And I want you to look at this. This is in the shadow of St Paul's. And when you go and think about getting a green roof on your shed, you'll go and buy a product. And it's generally a seed and blanket. Because that's what we do. We buy products. So Eversheds are a big legal firm up in Cheapside. They got this green roof. They said, Dusty, is any good for biodiversity? I said, well, it's not a bad seed and roof, but it's not really that interesting for biodiversity. So they said, how can we make it better for biodiversity? I said, well, put some seeds in it that are appropriate for the centre of London, the bomb sites after the Second World War. Oops. And that's what it looks like now. I do tours every year, non-COVID. It's full of vipers, bugloss, echium vulgare, and it's packed full of invertebrates. And actually, Mark's done this on his roof over at Numura as well, which was a seed and blanket too. And the great thing about this is we can actually mix things together. We can put solar with green roofs, and solar produces more energy when it's on vegetation. And actually, the solar panels increase the, ve the biodiversity because the wind and the sunshade of the panel creates little microclimates which get different plants on them. So you can combine these things. This is one in Switzerland. And uh, last year, I go and went up on a roof up in Barnet, and uh, I found this butterfly 15 years ago, and the expert said, no, you can't have found this small blue butterfly on a roof in Deptford. And actually, I didn't have a photograph of it, I was dismissed. And on this roof up in Barnet, there is now quite a large colony of small blue butterflies. And I suspect there's small blue butterflies over a lot of London up on these roofs if kidney vetch is there. And um, it's also about us, because actually, because of COVID, we're far more aware that actually we need green space. And green space in cities, most of a city is a roof. And so actually we put these parks up. This is above Charing Cross Station. Probably none of you know that. Um, there's a roof garden up there. And this is on 120 Fenchurch Street. You can in normal times go to this roof without booking. And the City of London has an aspiration for all new roof gardens to be open to the public without having to book. And what is this, I've been going on about this for four years. Um, there's probably a few ecologists here, and you know, we put these green roofs up for biodiversity, and they go, people can't go on them. You know, I live on Blackheath. I can walk across Blackheath. It's full of rare bees that Mark was talking about. And people walk on it every day. This is in Berlin. This is social housing in Berlin, a meadow, just a wild meadow, that people can go and sit on a table and a bench and look at the wild meadow. They're even allowed to sunbathe on it. There's a little sign, you can see a little sign there. It's got a little dog on it. You're not allowed to take your dog on it because of you know, you know why. Um, and actually there's another little German sign. So the Germans are so technically correct. They go, if you're sunbathe, sunbathe in a different place the next day so that actually you don't destroy the vegetation. It's actually true, there's a sign there. So I, I take people up on roofs in normal times, and this is on 120 Bishop's, 202 Bishopsgate. And this is in June. This looks like Dungeness if you've ever been to Dungeness. And the two people in the front of this photograph have worked in this office for 15 years and never been on this roof. Why not? Why can't they go and sit and enjoy a wild meadow? What happens if they're accessible? High-end landscaping, lots of topsoil, lots of trees and bushes and bamboo, and not necessarily good stuff for biodiversity. So, come up next year onto Eversheds and sit on a deck chair and enjoy the black red start, which is actually on this roof, and all the wonderful wildflowers up there. But it gets to you now, because you can do it on your shed, or your garage, or your extension. And there's a guide there, actually, I wrote two years ago with John Little, who's quite well known in this world for not using topsoil and putting wildflowers in ceramic waste and rubble and rubbish. And actually, the wildflowers survive the drought better in that sort of stuff. So this is actually a Land Rover garage. She's got four Land Rovers. And in the 2011 drought, if you can remember, it was a spring drought, it was the only bit of Essex that survived the drought. And that's because it was done properly. And you can put them on a little shed like this. 
And my favourite one is this. This is the, oh no, it's not, this is actually some more. And you'll notice here on the right hand side, the one with the bare earth, what we do, we go, I want my green immediately. No. Like the tree man said, like Mark will say, you know, let's seed things, plant things, and let the plants decide how they want to be on a roof. Because a roof is a very stressful place. So this is one of my favourite ones. This is an architect we met, uh, a mate of my mate, John Little. He bought a, a house down in Senon, and it's the first and last green roof in England. And the point here for me is, as I told you, I collected seeds way, way back and put them on the Le Barn Dance Centre. In fact, there's hare's foot clover, if you know that plant, all over Roos of London, because I collected it from the East India Dock Nature Reserve in 2001, and I've been spreading the love for oh, 20, 20 years. But they, I said to them, don't buy any flowers. When you go for your walk, collect all the seeds from the cliffs around Senon and put those seeds on your roof because they want to be there. And this roof is beautiful, covered in thrift, and it's lovely. So, design cities for nature. They'll be better for people, and they'll be better for the solitary bees. And, oh, I don't know why that's there, but where, there's, where there is, there's, this is why. If you think of London where there's too much concrete or pavement, that's where there's poverty. World Green Day is on June the 6th. If you have a green roof, put pictures up and tell the world about your wonderful green roof. If you haven't, get one done by June the 6th and post some pictures. And thank you very much. I like, it's nice having an audience. <laughs> Thanks very much, Dusty. Um, our next speaker, um, Paul Lawston, has not appeared yet. So um, Katie Boyles has very kindly agreed to go next. Um, Katie um, is going to be talking about community acti activism and how to get involved, um, including the Warren Farm case study. So welcome. Got a, note, got a notepad. It's very official. Here we go. Hi everyone, my name's Katie and unlike everybody else here, I am an expert in nothing. I've been invited here today, despite this, to share with you some of the things I've learned about community activism, which is a journey I'm still very much on, um, from a complete amateur to where I am today, which is a complete amateur who has seen some stuff. Um, so hopefully I'll get to inspire you to get involved in your local green spaces in ways that perhaps you haven't thought possible until now. Let's find out. I'll give you some context. I've got this. It's fine. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about my own local green space, which is Warren Farm. What is Warren Farm? So Warren Farm is a 61-acre um, neutral and acid grassland habitat, and it's based in Ealing in West London in Southall. And um, it has a very long eight-year history. And it would be impossible to give you that history in eight minutes. I'd need many other people up here with me to share their stories to do it justice for the activism that's happened to try and protect this green space. It really is sort of Game of Thrones in terms of the epicness and the twists and turns that this piece of land has had on our local community. Essentially, what's happened is Ealing Council wanted to give this land to QPR, Queen Park Rangers football, for a peppercorn rent, one pound for 200 years. Um, and that would have taken where this land was previously sports pitches um, out of the sort of community public access. It would be owned by a private company. And the site of importance for nature conservation that ran on the land would have been completely destroyed. Six years, campaign groups took legal action against the Ealing Council to protect this land and to keep it in the public domain. But they were all unsuccessful. And in that time, however, even though those campaigns weren't sort of working at the time to really protect the land, they did achieve in slowing things down. And as they slowed time down and the progress that the, you know, the private company and Ealing Council wanted to make, the costs went up for QPR. Eventually, QPR had to scale back their plans and they added landfill onto the site. Um, well, that was the plan anyway, because then they could make money off of the landfill, which is something that's happening quite a lot around London, it would seem. And while all these legal wranglings were happening, where the community were working really hard to try and stop this land from being given away, something really incredible was happening. One farm went back to nature, because nobody was touching it anymore. 
it essentially rewilded and it started to show us things that we didn't know were originally there. Warren Farm is called Warren Farm because it was once a farm. And in that time, as Mark Spencer will tell you, there was a seed bank that had been undisturbed for all this time and it started to come up and show us some of the incredible plants and wildlife that this land had. So how did I get involved? I was just a dog walker. I was just someone that walked my dog. I came to events like this, I wandered around parks, I looked at trees, I knew what a few of them were. Um, but I, this one particular day, I bumped into someone from QPR and their ecologist. And we have skylarks um, on Warren Farm. They're a UK red-listed bird. Um, they're, you know, really under threat. They've lost 60% of their population. And they survive on um, meadow habitats. And mainly in sort of farming methods um, and things like this have mean that their habitats have sort of really declined. And so this species is super rare and needs looking after. I said to the ecologist, there's skylarks nesting here. You can't start developing now. And he said, oh, yes, what we'll do, every skylark nest we find, because they nest in the ground, we'll give a five-meter radius from all of the landfill. That is not OK. So I went home, and I rang the RSPB, and I said, hey, look, there's this thing. It's really niggling me. And they put me in touch with the Met Wildlife Crime Unit, and they came out with me, and I showed them around. There were skylarks, there were swifts, you name it, it was all happening. I then discovered on the reports that the ecologists had done, that they described the land as having little to no ecological value and that it was species poor. I might not be an expert, but I didn't need to see an be an expert to see that that simply wasn't true. That then sent me on this journey where we got the local community involved and we started to gather evidence. We had a lot of local support and I reached out to what I discovered to be a really generous nature community. People like Mark, Sophie Le Guel, Peter Edwards, they came and they assessed the land for me. And even though I thought I knew this green space really well, when you go to a green space with somebody who is an expert in something, it's like swallowing a pill in the matrix. You see it in a whole new different way. It's like you're on another planet, and it's an incredible experience. We wanted to understand exactly what we would be losing if this place was covered in landfill. This led to the most, legal, most recent legal case, when judicial review was granted. It was amazing. And it was granted on the basis that Ealing Council failed to undertake an environmental impact assessment before they were willing to give away the land for development. We had a really strong and gutsy client on the front of this case. It never made it to court. And only because QPR pulled out of the deal that they had for the land. And so Ealing Council pulled out too, because there's no point in them trying to defend it if QPR no longer there. So that's to say, the struggles, the sacrifice, the time, the energy, the fundraising, everything the community brought together, although they failed, strictly speaking, they all won. Because without all of those activists, over that course of time, we wouldn't be in the position we are today. And there's a pattern to be seen here. So the Brent River and Canal Society is a charity that was founded by a gentleman called Luke Fitzherbert in 1973. And he formed the Brent River Park, known as the Lungs of London, over in West London. Warren Farm is part of the Lungs of London. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be where we are now fighting for it now. The point being, it's a cumulative community effort to truly look after our green spaces. Which brings me to today. I'm coming back to that one. So now, from being a dog walker, picking up poo, enjoying skylarks, I'm now a trustee with the Brent River and Canal Society, and I'm running the Warren Farm Nature Reserve um, campaign. And the Brent River Canal Society have published a really forward-thinking vision, which is to turn Warren Farm and this, all the surrounding Brent River Park meadows into a local nature reserve, and we're asking Union Council to give this land local nature reserve designation. It was inspired by Kabir Cole, who's the young conservationist, and Phil Bellman, the naturalist, put this together. There it is. We didn't draw a fish on a map, I promise you. It just turned out that way when we looked at all the meadows together. It's a lucky coincidence. But it would form a nature recovery network, 
so we can roam freely. And it's about humans and wildlife being able to interact together in that way. We need to get better working with nature rather than forcing it to the sides of how we live our lives. And if David Attenborough says we need nature recovery networks, we need nature recovery networks. David Attenborough is saying it. We started a petition that now has over 9,000 supporters, and we only started it back in July. It's had local and international support. We've been on BBC London News a few weeks ago, and Warren Farm is still under threat of being lost, despite knowing exactly how much biodiversity we risk losing. We've reached out to Ealing Council, and I have to say their initial response has been positive. We'll have to see. Which takes me to this. I'd like to give you five things I've personally learned about community activism that hopefully will inspire you to do the same, or it will terrify you, but do it anyway. The first one is, activism is a spectrum. Whether you chain yourself to a tree, dig yourself in holes in the grounds, whether you get home, make a cup of tea, send a very polite email to the council asking them not to mow those green verges for, for the sake of the pollinators, you can call yourself an activist. It's okay, it's not a dirty word. Every action every single one of us takes builds up to make a difference. Warren Farm you know, really shows you that. Talk to other activists, because a lot of the time, their journey started from something that happened on their doorstep as well. Number two, pay attention to the green spaces that you love. It's really easy to take places like this for granted. COVID has shown us how small and connected we are around the world. We had a rye neck, see the neck in the rye position, um, which is a very... Um, it's called a lifer. Birders call this bird a lifer because you're lucky if you see one in your life. Um, it turned up to Warren Farm, having come from Scandinavia, flew into Ealing for a pit stop to uh, catch up on some food. It then flew to Iberia, and then it went to North Africa. And we saw it right here. Every green space we have is a contribution to the wider ecological and climate challenge that we're facing whether it's the roundabout at the end of your street, the plants growing at the bottom of the trees that line your street, to space. My third point is don't assume someone else is dealing with it. All the wildlife trusts and charities, all the incredible individuals you've met here today, they work incredibly hard on very little. You don't have to be an expert to make a difference. I mean, you know, it helps, um, but you just have to care. You can become an amateur species recorder, which is what I am. You can volunteer, you can fundraise, you can get involved here at Fulham Palace. They have volunteers, I'm sure they could always do with more. Don't think you don't have something to bring. I have a chronic pain condition, so I can't dig you a pond. And when I'd see people running around planting trees and asking people to help, I'd be like, I'd love to help, but I, I can't. But I can run a campaign, and I can make a poster, and I can make a phone call to someone that might help. Support environmental organizations. Contact your local councillors and MPs. Use your voice, use your vote. Sign my petition. WarrenFarmNatureReserve.co.uk My fourth point is, get organized. Find your team. The Warren Farm Nature Reserve group now, we've upped our management team recently to 10. We're working on some really big community-led initiatives. Our oldest member is in his 80s, and our youngest is five. Learn from the experienced experts. Pass that knowledge down. Have a range of people with different skills and different experiences. We're now two charities working together. It's the Brent River and Canal Society in partnership with CPRE London, and we're in their 10 new parks campaign. They currently have nine, they're looking for one more. If you have a green space near you that you think is being underused or in threat of development, give me a shout or give them a shout. We have supporters now like London National Park City, the Ealing Ramblers Association are supporting us, the Barn Owl Trust. Bring together all the help you can get and good communication is everything. And lastly, I'm going back to the fish map, hold on to your wonderment because on campaigns like the one I'm running now, it's really easy to forget why you got involved in this in the first place. It can be a lot of work. Walk your dog, 
listen to the skylarks, scrutinise a poo and ask, is that a hedgehog here that did that? Do I need to add that to my species records? What a fabulous place Warren Farm is. We have rare clovers. I didn't know that was before I met Mark. We've got barn owls. We have yarrow pugs, these incredible little delicate looking moths. I promise you, you can have a much bigger impact than you think you can. So please use your voice and please get involved in the green spaces that you love so much because you really have to, otherwise you could lose them. Thank you. Thanks very much, Katie. Um, our next speaker is uh, going to be beamed in. Um, so Judy Ling Wong uh, is joining us to talk about access to nature, um, includes, including interpretation um, and opening sites up for everyone. So I'll just hand over to Judy. It is a joy to be here, to be among people of goodwill that wish to understand and to act around the issues of diversity, equality and inclusion. In the UK, it is an optimistic picture because the number of people that are of goodwill far outnumber races that do so much damage. But goodwill is never enough. It must be turned into action. And when that happens, it is powerful. It is only a few days since Derek Chauvin was convicted of murdering George Floyd. Black Lives Matter, against the context of this event, over a year ago now, has sent a wave of emotion, not only nationally, but internationally throughout the world, giving impetus to this area of concern in our increasingly multicultural world. A few days ago, I wrote to many of my friends and colleagues. I said, I stand with my black brothers and sisters on this momentous day of the conviction of Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd. So much remains to be done. There is only one race, human race. And now I would like to share a poem that I wrote on that special day with you. It is as if on this day, I walk into the bright sunshine and find no menace in the shadows. I let myself savor an illusion, a delusion, just for a little while. For since Floyd's slow, long, dark death, more had died each and every day. With no memory or rare justice, the struggle carries on after we pause to celebrate just for a little while. For now, walk with me in the grand illusion, in the seemingly endless sunshine, in comfort, just for a little while. Today, at this moment, I feel that all of you are walking with me in that sunshine of goodwill. The sentence, one race, human race, is so important. Let us remember together that science tells us that we all came out of Africa. We've traveled across time, separating ourselves and creating that intrinsically human thing called culture, settling in different places and then forgetting that we ever moved, settling in different places into fantasized separateness. Archaeologists know all about this. Indeed, the uniqueness of culture that exists are the unique combinations of cultures. Cultures combine and evolve, especially through selecting what we like from others. Fireworks celebrating New Year right across the world originate in China. Or look at Holland with its entire culture based on tulips. That flower is Tulipa persica, coming from the region that we now call Iraq and Iran. Or the great traditional British Christmas dinner with all its main features coming from elsewhere. Coming back to plants, embodied within every garden in the UK 
is our shared history because the movement of plants follow the movement of people. So National Trust Gardens are probably some of the most multicultural gardens in the world. The multicultural interpretation of plants will reveal all of the UK's multicultural history. Summer is so special as an opportunity to make connections. Once long ago, people in London flocked to the docks in summer to see an array of beautiful plants that grew from the spilled seed from ships. The beginnings of an irresistible longing for their colour and variety, leading to that very British tradition of putting in summer bedding plants. We are a nation of gardeners, and the more fabulous our garden is, the more multicultural it is. There are azaleas from the plant hunters that wandered across the Himalayas, roses from Europe, orchids from the swamps and jungles of the Americas, iconic Chinese wisterias, the fiery maple trees, the delicate pleasure of alpine bulbs, graceful Asiatic lilies, dahlias from Mexico, or the vast range of pelagoniums from Africa. And here in London, we're told that the London plain, that is so much part of our consciousness, was an accidental hybrid in the nurseries of the Tradescans, the great plant hunters. Sharing access to gardens opens up new experiences of enjoyment, the intercultural relationships to people. People too are culturally rich and full of colour, just like plants, and they carry unique knowledge, skills and marvellous stories about plants from all over the world. Within the unifying concept of multiculturalism, where we recognise that we are one race, the human race, we acknowledge that different cultures illustrate the full range of the human potential at its most magnificent and also its most horrific. When we meet someone from a different culture, there is always a gift, an awakening within us of something that another culture reveals. When that happens, that awakening of what was dormant within us is the giving back to us of something that is part of ourselves. So what does the multicultural interpretation of plants mean in terms of organisational positioning within the simple commitment of having our gardens open to everyone? One dimension of multicultural interpretation is about the sharing of history and its pleasures through the magnificence of plants in context. One real pleasure that can be enabled is simply to identify and make known the range of plants from different cultures. With generations of different ethnic minorities that have been born in this country, especially people living in poverty and without gardens, to see which plants are from their country of heritage is poignant and wonderful. Doing this in gardens facilitates an instant connection and promotes a sense of welcome and a sense of belonging. I have always loved spring. When I see magnolias and camellias bursting into flower, they carry cultural resonance for me as a Chinese person. They are the landscape of my childhood. And here they are as part of the UK's garden landscape just as much as I am part of the UK's community. With COVID, we all know that access to nature plays a great role in physical and mental health. The environmental sector is very special as a setting for the building of community. What it offers in terms of experience and activities is entirely positive. Being in environmental settings, whether it is being in parks and gardens, nature reserves, ancient woodlands, or our wonderful national parks, 
they are all settings within which friendships and community relationships may be built and strengthened. Some of the activities that Fulham Palace offers, like growing plants from seed, are particularly wonderful as it brings families together and exposes children to a miracle. Such experiences at an early age marks people for the rest of their lives. In 30 years of working with engagement with people, I can collapse the entire process into just two phrases. We love what we enjoy and we protect what we love. Enabling access to nature is enabling enjoyment. And so begins that simple human process that when we love what we enjoy, it is followed ultimately by releasing a vast missing contribution by excluded people to nature from any disadvantaged group. Ultimately, we reap the rewards of giving back to nature by people joining us with a passion to act to see nature flourish. This is crucial now in our world, on both the fronts of taking care of nature and taking care of people, we need to stimulate and expand action. Beautiful places like Fulham Palace have a significant role to play. Such places are the inspiration that we all need. I'm grateful that I'm here today out of the goodwill expressed by Fulham Palace to ensure that what it has to offer is open to everyone. Nature for people and people for nature is a two-way street paradigm that invests in the future of people and nature thriving together. I look forward to more. Thank you for listening. Thanks to Judy, and Judy will be joining us for the Q&A. Um, so we've got one more speaker, and then after that we'll have a short break, and then um, the Q&A where all the speakers will be back, um, and you can ask some questions. Um, so the next speaker um, I'm going to introduce you to is Miranda Lowe, who's a principal curator at the Natural History Museum. Miranda will be talking about the decolonizing museums and access to natural history collections and knowledge. Right, welcome everyone. Right, I'm hoping this save is the best till last. <laughs> <laughs> right, so um, what does decolonising museums mean? Or in terms of myself, um, decolonising natural history? Um, there are a lot of um, um, many projects within that, but for me, decolonising natural history is about, and it links in with what Judy was saying, is about inclusivity and recognising and acknowledging some of the um, hidden histories and stories and narratives that lie within that. And um, in terms of people that look like me, there are some amazing um, uh, stories that I'm going to share with you that I have revealed in the course of my 30 years working at the Natural History Museum because um, it's really amazing to have access to such wide breadth of collections and um, also talking to lots of people and I enjoy nature and um, you know a, a, this beautiful garden just as much as anybody else. So here we have an image um, uh, painted by an artist called Jean-Baptiste de Brett, a French artist who um, around 1839, uh, 1834 to 1839 um, was in Brazil and he was docu documenting the natural history, the nature, the culture of the people that lived in Brazil. And so here, this image kind of summarizes what I do and what I encourage people to do. Observing nature, collecting, it's there for sharing for all the wonders of nature. Um, you can see here that there's collections of plants and animals. Um, some of them would have ended up in natural history collections um, that I work with and that Mark works with, especially the botanical side of things. And we've got a net to um, collect butterflies and other insects. 
Um, but it's a really great, great image. And so um, that's some of what I do. I go to various archives, such as the New York Public Library, and it's been great during lockdown to be able to have that kind of digital access um, um, at the, literally at the tip of my fingertips. So here you can see there's an image on um, my left-hand side of uh, Sir Hans Sloan. And in the middle, you have got a plant here of cocoa, cocoa bean, cocoa pod. And then on the far right, on my far right, um, is an image that I, I took a couple of days ago, actually, when, when the weather was glorious, of the Natural History Museum where I work. And all those three images are linked together. So Hans Sloan, um, it's the person who um, created the uh, collections within the British Museum originally, and then in 1881, um, the South Kensington um, uh, branch of the British Museum, so it was called the British Museum um, uh, Natural History. So all the natural history collections from the British Museum went to South Kensington. And um, so one of the, um, the hidden histories that I reveal there, and kind of links to my own cultural heritage, so my parents came from the Caribbean, um, to the UK is the cocoa. So, Han, so Hans Sloan um, collected um, in Jamaica, he was a physician, but also he collected a lot of um, plants, over 800 plant species in Jamaica and was observing the enslaved Africans that were moved from Africa um, to Jamaica at that time, but also observing what they did with these plants, all the medicinal properties. And in terms of cocoa, um, it has links to my heritage because as a little girl, my parents um, would have the cocoa um, beans, or, I mean, you can get cocoa now available in supermarkets and things like that, but when I was a little girl, um, that um, we would get sort of um, parcels sent from the Caribbean with these kind of treats and the cocoa bean. And my, my folks used to grate that and make what I called cocoa tea. And the interesting link there, as well as Hans Sloan observing how the enslaved Africans use, uh, use that produce and how it was grown as well, because it came from um, Central America originally, um, is grating and making a tea which he considered was quite bitter and, and the medicinal property at that point in time and he did actually say that it was quite nauseous and um, and too hard to digest um, for any patients um, that he was the physician or the doctor too at that time that might have had stomach ailments so he was suggesting at that point in time that um, you take that as um, warmed or you would add the cocoa to to sweeten other medicines and so as, as a young girl it was a bitter tea um, boiled, boiled in hot water but my parents would add condensed milk to it so that was the sweetener and as we all know you know Hans Sloan actually popularized um, you know we talk about Hans Sloan drinking chocolate and the milk chocolate that we have today and that's just a lovely website. Um, I'm sure, Mark, you must be familiar with this one. <laughs> but um, I, I show it here because um, it's really nice to have, again, um, a while you're at home and surfing online, looking at things to find this website and the way that things are, are laid out and that you can print off these leaf leaflets. Again, making nature and the origins of some of the plants um, where, where they've come from and the cultural um, heritage that they have in communities are all embraced in, in, in this kind of poster here with the cocoa and this is an image here botanical image of it um, via the um, naturalist um, Mark um, Catsby So when you next visit the museum, and the museums will be opening very soon, middle of May, fingers crossed, um, so when you go into the Hinsey Hall, the main central hall at the NHM, I, I urge you to look up um, because you're, m you're missing the beautiful spectacle that is 162 um, botanical ceiling panels, um, once known um, because of a, a popularized book, The Gilded Canopy, um, which each individual panel behind that there is a story um, and one of the stories oh. Oh, it's, it's not moving <laughs> So it's not moving to the next slide. Okay, there we go. And um, so one of the stories 
um, that has really resonated with me is um, a ceiling panel that has the plant called Quasia Amara. And you can find that panel and you go to the second floor black balcony of the museum and it's um, kind of diagonally opposite um, or or above, anyway, of the a slice of a giant sequoia, so head for there. But what is interesting about this plant, and it's not often that you get this recognised or find out this kind of incredible history. So plants and animals are often named after the countries of origin or the people that found them. And um, so I'll just move on quickly. So that plant was named after this gentleman here that you see, which is on my left, which will be your right, um, all dressed up in this, um, you know, uh, golden laced uh, blue coat and red trim waistcoat. It's Graman Kwasi. Now, um, he was previously enslaved, but he got his freedom um, and he was, um, uh, he was living in Suriname and there he was a healer and a doctor and um, in his own way, and his culture discoverer of plants and medicinal uses and one of them was of that plant again boiled as a, a bitter tea and the bark also used as well and he would use that for because Suriname at the time in the mid 1700s was um, a Dutch colony but he would use um, um, his practice to actually cure the ailments um, purge into intestinal parasites and reduce fever of not only um, the Dutch colonies but also um, the black and white natives in, in, in Suriname at the time. He was slightly controversial but in this context I'm just revealing that hidden history and the acknowledgement. Um, so on my right hand side, your left, is Carl Linnaeus and he's the Swedish botanist. So all the beautiful plants and the grass that we're sitting on, things like that, he um, popularised and named and worked on identifying a new species a plant and he named um, that plant so the and so how that information came back to Europe and into the um, hands of Carl Linnaeus was via um, a, a, a student um, of a student of, of, of Carl Linnaeus, but also a friend of Carl Linnaeus that was residing and owned a plantation in Suriname, um, got the recipe from Graman Quasi and took samples of that plant and Carl Linnaeus eventually named and described it. So another story that we have here is Ali Wallace, a teenager um, from Malaysia, and um, a, a connection and a link, a working relationship to Alfred Russell Wallace. And we might have um, heard of Alfred Russell Wallace and a lot more in terms of, of birds from the Amazon and Malaysia and his work on the Malaysian archipelago at that time. And so um, he had Ali Wallace as his guide. Um, so Ali, again, we're talking about the connection of um, imparting local knowledge to a naturalist and a collector. And um, what is really um, lovely about their working relationship and connection um, that Ali is actually mentioned in Alfred Russell Wallace's autobiography. And you don't often get um, uh, people of colour identified in that way and named. Often it's very difficult to find the names in the archives. And it was great that in the autobiography that there is a picture of Ali, which I show you here as well. And um, Wallace um, does acknowledge, um, you know, the work that they both did together in terms of collecting birds and um, other um, knowledge in, within Malaysia. But what I'm with me telling this story, what I'm also recognising is that some of the birds that were collected are not actually doesn't have Ali's name attributed to it. It's called the Wallace Collection and it's most of the time at, um, in terms of Alfred Russell Wallace. So in terms of revealing these, these histories and these narratives, you're putting them alongside others to create quite a, a holistic picture um, that someone like Ali as well should um, be acknowledged to. And um, Wallace also does document that when he was ill, Ali would look after him during their travels and collecting trips and observing nature, and it would be it would vice versa. So it was, um, you know, um, a very um, wonderful kind of way of working in the field. And then, I think last but not least, we've got John Edmonston. 
um, and Charles Darwin. And um, again, this is an amazing story because we see Charles Darwin as this old grey um, haired and bearded man, but he was young once, like all of us here. Um, <laughs> and um, so when Charles Darwin went to Edinburgh to study medicine, he didn't quite like that, but he came across John Edmonston, who had travelled with his owner, as was then um, Charles Edmonston from um, Demerara at the time from um, South America and um, resided, um, well, um, came to the UK and went to Scotland, but then travelled to Edinburgh. And um, John Edmonston um, taught taxidermy to the students there. And um, Charles Darwin does document in his um, letters to his sister, Susanna, in, I think, 1823, saying that he's found this young gentleman who, um, at a really good price, could teach him how to do taxidermy, stuff birds. And that was Charles Darwin at the age of, you know, 17, 18. And, and it shows, um, actually, the impact that John Edmonston had in terms of telling the stories of what it was like in South America and being being enslaved and the kind of plants and animals that Charles might see eventually when he at the age of um, 20, 21 went on the, um, the ship called the Beagle on his first voyage around the world observing nature, plants and animals but he would have got a lot of um, uh, information about the flora and fauna from John Edmonston before that trip because um, in Charles Darwin's autobiography, which was published after his death, it, he actually does talk about John Edmonston and meeting him as a young man. And so I've just given you a flavour of some of the, the hidden histories that um, I talk about at the museum um, when I was last there. So I devised a tour to actually take people around the Hinsey Hall to have a look at the specimens because there are many layers to the objects and, um, you know, the, the other the stories that, that we hear. And as I said, it's nice to get a fuller picture and to kind of embrace everybody's culture that is, is of value. And and it's new ways of looking at things as well in terms of, you know, just like recipes that, um, that we might have handed down from our own families, you know, talk about them, that grandma so-and-so used to make this, and, but then we have our variation on the same theme. So that's all to be embraced. And what you've got here is just um, somebody who came on my very first um, Black History Tour at the museum who was a secondary school teacher and actually tweeted about it. I hadn't actually told anyone that the tour was going to happen. And so the members of the public were actually coming to a late event on another topic at the museum, but I was able to trial this out and people actually loved it. And um, I've been sharing it ever since. Right. And just last but not least to leave you with that uh, um, I love nature as much as everybody so I've been doing a lot, a lot of walking on my own but I can't wait to um, uh, go back walking with this group called Wild in the City that actually shows me that within um, what we call London there are lots of lovely green spaces. Um, I think this was a, a walk out in New Addington in, in one of the woods out there um, but yeah it's just such a beautiful picture and we have such beautiful spaces and nature around us. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Miranda. And um, we've just got a quick five minute break now till five past three. Um, all the speakers are going to come back uh, into the tent. Um, and uh, Paul Beattie Pownall is going to uh, chair a Q&A session. Um, so we're going to start off with some questions we've received in advance online and then take questions from the audience. So we'll see you again in five minutes.
back, everybody. So we've got the Q&A session now, and I'd like to introduce Paul Beattie Pownall, who <laughs> is going to be chairing the Q&A session. And so we've got questions for some of the speakers that we've already been um, set, and we'll have an opportunity to ask any questions of you, the audience. Um, but I'll get Paul started off with some of the pre-questions. Hello. Um, I'd like to correct Katie in one thing that uh, she's not the only person here who's not an expert. Um, I was I'm the chair of the oh, there she is. I'm the chair of the London uh, the uh, what's it called the London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham Climate and Ecological Emergency Commission, and the commission was set up shortly after the borough declared a climate emergency, and the point of the declaration was to then establish a target that we're going to reduce our emissions to zero, net zero by 2030, which seems like a hugely ambitious um, um, target, but actually it's a really necessary one. Um, the commission set up, um, or got together 12 local residents, and as residents we were asked to help the council understand what they needed to do. Uh, and that struck us as a little bit of a challenge for 12 non-experts, but we put together a report um, and established four kind of guiding principles. First of all, the council needs to establish a vision. And hence I'm wearing this extraordinary sweatshirt, and there's a few others around here wearing similar sweatshirts. The vision now says, imagine what it would be like if we did manage to reduce our carbon emissions to net zero by 2030. Imagine what a fantastic place that would be. The point here is that it is something to look forward to. So by reducing our emissions, we make the world a better place to live. And then in order to do that as well, we need to grow our knowledge. We realize that as, as the residents were asking the council difficult questions, we realized we need to know an awful lot more about it. We're very good at calculating how much it costs to do something. So if the council is going to be building policies, they're very good at saying that policy is going to cost this much and it's going to achieve this much kind of return on the revenue. But we don't really understand yet what the carbon implications are of those policies. So we need to build knowledge. But we really need to build that knowledge at the local level. We need to understand what needs to be done in this borough. And then we need to communicate. We need to get the council to engage and explain to everybody in the, in the borough what lies ahead. What would happen if we didn't change the way we're doing things? and enable then people to do things differently. And then the final of our fourth demands is to make a plan. Let's work out what we can do now and then make a plan for what needs to happen over the next 10 years. Let's think about those situations where we've got contracts that are already in place that might need renewing in five years' time so that when we go out to tender, we renew those contracts, we're ready with the right specification and ensure that anybody who serves this council does so on the basis that they won't be emitting any carbon by 2030. So it really needs thinking through. We've got a 10-year plan, or we're expecting the council to produce that 10-year plan. So the next step, so we published a report, and that can be found on the council website, and that report's going in front of Cabinet on Tuesday evening, so everybody can get onto YouTube and watch Cabinet and see them debate that report. And we're very much hoping that they're going to ratify that report and that and helps us then make sure that they deliver on those, on those recommendations. But we actually need a lot of help because what we discovered when we're talking to the council is how amazing, and I think, again, Katie's brilliant at saying this, if you write that one email, it makes a huge difference. It really does. And it's extraordinary how councillors and the leader of the council will respond, not necessarily answer your email, but they will actually think they'll take it on board. And we need to make sure that we get many, many more people that are asking the council to do the right thing and move much closer towards the net zero. They get an awful lot of emails from people who are asking the council to make sure they have the freedom to drive their car as fast as they can through the borough. It's extraordinary the, the pressure the council are on to keep those roads open. We need to understand, is that the right thing to do in the future? And the only way that we can get the council to think differently and, and, and get the right balance between biodiversity and traffic is to write to the council and put them under pressure. So I'll ask anybody who's listening to me now, just one quick email to your councillor, to Stephen Cowan, the leader of the council, 
or to anybody you know in the council, please support the Commission's report. It's really important that we see a really wide range of support for that, for that report. Thank you. Anyway, so that, that was my little piece. And back to today. Um, it's been fantastic listening to the speakers. I've got a few questions that have been sent through. And I might just kick off one that kind of springs off that report. I, I sense the theme, actually, which is interesting, because it's one that we picked up on the Commission. And the theme is a question about what do we do with our land? There seems to be a, um, a continuous struggle between whether we use our land for planting and biodiversity, or whether we use our land for buildings, or whether we use it for transport and traffic. And, and that, that's one of the challenges I think we've got ahead, is that perhaps we need to change that balance. So my question to the speakers would be, so I'll, I'll, I'll read out properly. I think it's important that we start to think about how we can welcome nature back into our borough. In order to massively increase the amount of biodiversity, we will need to find more space for plants. We currently prioritise using our land for cars and development or other forms of transport. How can we promote the transition to redesign our streets so that they can accommodate more wildlife? I might put pressure on Katie to be the first to stand up. As, as a local activist, or as somebody who understands how to, do, 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 to, to lodge the debate, but if any other panellists have any ideas, so how, do we, how do we get that balance and shift from land to, to plant, uh, street? To not on the spot at all right now that's <laughs> fine um again not being an expert but having met lots of people that are i think um one person we know really well sophie laguel she runs an amazing thing called more than weeds and she's a real sort of liberator that to not see every plant as a weed and when we talked about earlier how on your streets you can have um, that sort of green roundabout that the cars are all driving around, so that sort of trees on your streets, there's sort of where the council are going round, no offence, just in case, um, <laughs> good, just checking, good, um, you know, putting weed killer and killing plants just to make things look neat and tidy. I think we just really need to change how people look at how we see nature and plants. A dandelion isn't a weed, it's an amazing flower for a pollinator. Um, I think things like that that are really important. I think also, like I said earlier as well, check out CPRE London's 10 New Parks campaign because they're actually doing something right now about this, which is taking spaces that have been lost or ab abandoned in a way, perhaps that were once used by the community or were once a green space that had a lot of love in it, that have now been left to sort of rot and, and degrade in a way that isn't helpful to biodiversity or the local community. You can take action as a community and make sure those green spaces are brought back to life. Um, I think the talk earlier about the green roofs is also super important and how what you can do with your own garden spaces and right outside your own front door I think is a really impressive thing to do. I've got some bins that I have to have. I'm about to get something built on the top of those and we're going to have a sort of green roof just to, just to that, just to hide the bins but also for nature. Um, I think all those things are really important. Build a pond. And it doesn't have to be a big pond. Water life is so important. You can get like a little tub, like the ones you clean your dishes with. Just plant it in your garden. Just dig it in. Just leave it and see what happens. You'll be amazed what turns up. I've got smooth newts in mine. What happens? They're incredible. One of them's pregnant. Whoa, what's going on in my garden? I feed birds now too. I have a great spotted woodpecker that turns up. Um, every time and I'm just like that's my great spotted woodpecker because he's coming to my feeder um, I'm also really interested in things that you can do in the front and the back of your house and housing generally which is to create insect hotels and bee hotels and really exciting things like this so there's lots of little spaces where insects can go insects are in really sharp decline and that is serious and our councils have a responsibility to make sure that we are working as a community to turn that tide back. We need our insects. We wouldn't be here without insects. And also, from doing that, you discover other exciting things. Pollinators aren't just bees. There aren't there bats as well. There's night pollination. Moths go around pollinating things when it's dark. Bats do as well. So we need to look after our bat species and all our wildlife together. And I think ultimately what it really comes down to is that we're working with nature, not against it, and to stop blocking it out with things. And we can really do that. Get your street together, 
have a big discussion, see what you can bring, put bird boxes on your house and cut little corridors so that hedgehogs can all get through and they have a freedom to move. We're very good as humans just be like, this is my bit. It's not your bit. On paper, yeah, you might have bought that house and that garden, but it doesn't actually only belong to you. Birds and insects and plants don't think about it as your bit. Open your mind a little bit and share that and encourage your councillors to do the same. That's what I would say. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kate. That's brilliant. Um, do you want to come on and yeah, help on that? Brilliant. As I have done some work in Hammersmith and Fulham, it's not just about how you're going to manage your land in the future, it's also how you manage your land now. We did a, a, a climate proofing housing estate project, uh, Queen Caroline Estate, up uh, by the Apollo. A miniature grassland. We just mow it and mow it and mow it and mow it. So what we did, we turned all the miniature grassland into wildflower meadows that stored rainwater. What we have to see is biodiversity is part of other functions. Storing water, cooling. It's infrastructure. And if the council starts thinking about infrastructure, road calming. Why do we have tarmac? Why don't we have rain gardens like they have in Portland, Oregon? No, we just put some tarmac down and make a hump. Make plants and soil part of the infrastructure of Hammersmith and Fulham Council. Thank you very much. Yeah, Queen Caroline Estate is brilliant. There's lots of rhubarb there at the moment as well, so if anybody's hungry. Um, have we got any questions around the tent? Has anybody got any kind of burning things they want to ask any of the panellists? Otherwise, I'll go on to another, another question I've really got, which is a bit more of a technical one, because I'd like to ask, um, I think it was Russell, if you were going to advise the council about planting trees, which trees should they plant? Or is that, is that a, a week's course? <laughs> It's not, it's not that difficult, in the, um, and it relates to the previous question, because one of the real wins you can get is if you plant street trees, um, because street trees are part of the infrastructure of streets, and they're a really good place to add greenery and biodiversity. The important thing to remember about street trees is they're in very hostile environments. In London, it's hot. In a street, it's really hot. There's loads of reflective heat going on. So if you try and put something like a rowan into a street, nice native tree, it's just going to fry when it gets really hot, uh, particularly if there's any glass around or really uh, smooth surfaces. So you need to be quite flexible, quite imaginative about the species that you're using. Hackney is one of the boroughs that's done a really done great work on this. Um, and there are probably two to 300 different street tree species on Hackney streets now. And you need to be much broader than native. You need diversity, which is going to deal with um, all the uh, biodiversity threats. Um, you've got loads of tree diseases moving around the world. There's lots of potential threats to London Plain, which is obviously a key infrastructure st street tree in London. Um, so you need to be thinking about how big a tree can I get in that space? Is that space going to take a big tree? Or am I going to come back in 15, 20 years and think, oh, dear, I've got to pollard it, or I've got to cut it down? Um, so right tree, right place. And ideally, lots of trees from southern provenance um, in terms of Europe. But also, for street trees, you're going to have to think globally across the world. And one of the big challenges is China is buying a lot of the, uh, the, the stock at the moment, and there are going to be significant um, blocks on actually accessing these trees. So we need more native tree nurseries, more local tree nurseries, where we're growing stuff which isn't necessarily native, but which can grow in London where it's really, really hot. Um, so, yeah, there are lots of opportunities, but diversity in, in street trees. And Mike wants to jump in. I think it's also incredibly important to realize that um, trees do not exist on their own. Um, when we think about tree planting, particularly outside of the, tree and the, the street environment, we need to be thinking about what else goes into that ecosystem, into that environment. So when we plant an orchard, for example, yes, plant apple trees, plant flute trees, that's going to be good for certain types of pollinators. What are you going to plant underneath? What are you going to plant in the grass? If, if planting is the right choice, 
we should be planting lots of, say, um, meadow plants, herbs and stuff, geraniums, pelagoniums, not pelagoniums, geraniums that will be really useful for other animals and plants. And I think it's really important, this notion, you referenced it, of what we call in botany the near natives idea. Climate change is a really, really challenging thing and we need to be looking at plant communities from southern Europe which frankly will be able to actually help us through the next few hundred years of very, very severe change in our environment. So the idea of near natives, there's a, an oak tree, Quercus pubescens for example, which has a more greater resilience potentially to um, temperature changes that we're facing that could be useful. So trees do not live on their own. You need to be thinking about bulbs, herbaceous plants, climbers, whoever plants a new woodland and puts honeysuckle into it. Honeysuckle is an incredibly important part of our ecosystems. So you really need to think about those layers that you create and also connecting with the knowledge that's in your community. You know, one of the things I particularly love about the Warren Farming thing is, is the joy of working as an expert with an amateur group in helping them understand that we've got this incredibly rich heritage in Britain of knowledge about our wildlife. We are incredibly lucky in this country, but strangely, it's not very often that the natural history community in this country get asked. We will give you advice, help. We know a lot of stuff. We are here. We have been collecting records on Britain's wildlife for several hundred years. We know lots of information. Talk to us. Thank you. That's brilliant. Yeah. If anybody has... to create more biodiversity at the same time. Brilliant. Lucy, do you want to have a go at thinking about edible plants? Hello. Um, so I'm the head gardener here, if you didn't see me talk earlier. Um, yeah, I think it's brilliant. I think over the last year, um, uh, my friends, my family, people who had no idea, no clue about growing edible plants, it's just taken off. Um, so lockdown has given time um, for people to um, have a go at it, you know, if anything. And so I totally agree with you. Um, I mean, um, I hope people come to Fulham Palace and see our veg garden and get some inspiration from that. Certainly, we sell a lot of edible plants on our, on our barrow. Um, and I couldn't believe it. We've almost sold out of all of our tomatoes today. I'm thrilled. <laughs> um, there were loads this morning, by the way. I was a bit worried. Um, so, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I, I do... Um, I run small courses for sit, how to, uh, to sow seeds. I've got a grow your own veg um, uh, course coming up at the end of May. So I think it's, you know, if anybody wants to learn how to do it or needs help, then again, like what Mark said, you know, please do come here to Fulham Palace. Uh, my apprentices would love to talk, talk to, um, to anybody about it and also to, um, you know, we can kind of um, guide you on you know on anything you can do I mean we um it's not just the veg and we, we you know at, that we grow in our um uh, beds but there are other edible plants around we don't um have foraging here at Fulham Palace so much because we want to keep the um the the shrubbery and everything else for the public and for the wildlife but yeah there is a lot to to, to learn you know out there um uh, but certainly yeah and the veg garden is is kind of where it's at thanks Anybody else got anything to add to the edible part? Yeah, great. Yeah. Bit of a sideways comment about food growing is that um, we have a climate crisis going on. We've had COVID, people are growing their food. And I know, I go into Greenwich Park every day, bird watching. And in the Second World War, Greenwich Park was one massive allotment. And it just struck me. It was just covered in people growing veg vegetables. So perhaps we should turn our parks into urban farms for people.
One of the very important things about absolutely the need to develop localism, develop skills and knowledge in horticulture and growing food is we have to be aware also that London's population now is very large. Um, pressure and demand on space is immense on so many levels. There's so many completing needs and forage in particular is very, very popular. Um, and foraging is wonderful. I'm an enthusiastic forager myself. But again, a little bit of knowledge about the impacts of your activity and where you are doing it is incredibly important. So many of London's green spaces are very fragmented, very small and very vulnerable. Um, and we have seen damage in some of our public spaces and valuable natural history, particularly some of our ancient woodlands, through um, potentially at times quite aggressive foraging. So there's a, a bit of a, a difficult balance we have to make in this because foraging is a wonderful and extraordinary way of connecting people with the joy that is the natural world and the sensory pleasures. But our habitats are so small and so vulnerable now that we really need to think as individuals about our activity, how much we take from that space, and also communicate with the people who are responsible for that space and go, can your space withstand this? Because um, it is sometimes a little bit disturbing when I see uh, wonderful plants like Ramsons in some sites in London's chopped off and nothing left in some spaces. Thank you very much. Um, apparently we have a question from Judy who was talking earlier uh, by video link. Judy, are you, are you live? There we go. Do yes, here I am. I was going to mention the fact of the urban forest and how we need to increase the idea of the urban forest to not just the canopy, but on the ground itself, so that we look at the understory right and I think pavements are a great potential for this, not only by placing great big pots of plants on our pavements, but by actually planting where we actually have pavements. For example, in some boroughs, they begin to lift up the paving stones where they have trees in between trees, because that strip between one tree and another is never walked on. We just walk alongside where the tree is. So if you can do that, you increase an enormous amount of space to begin to plant bushes and all sorts of things that can actually improve biodiversity and coverage. The other area, of course, is social housing, which has so much green space, but often of the poorest quality. There again, it's about council attitudes to open up those spaces to some of the poorest communities where you can improve and diversify these mown lawns that we have everywhere to cover them with biodiversity in terms of plants and trees. Thank you, yes, very, very good point. And it, it reminds me of some discussions we had in the Commission about thinking about what good street design is. And, and there's some interesting measures out there. One, one might be a street where you feel safe to allow your child to make their own way to school independently, either by bike or walking from, say, the age of 12. If that's a, if that's a vision, if that's a measure, if it's safe for children from the age of 12 onwards to, to play in on their own, then it's a good design. At the moment, I can't think of many streets in this borough that are like that. Does anybody have, have any other questions? Any, any big, there's a burning question from Emily. Hi, everyone. Hello? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Emily. I'm an engagement officer in the Council and Ecological Emergency Team at the Council. And I guess I'm just really struck in all of the talks how it feels like so much of this just comes from a, a kind of belief as humans that we're separate from the natural world and that we can survive without this foundation. And that feels like it could be solved through education. So I would just love to hear any ideas that you have around education um, and like what might an education system look like in which we acknowledge how connected we are to the natural world. Miranda, do you want to have a go? I'll, I'll talk about opening up education. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you, but we're all interconnected. Um, and it does take me back uh, 
at the museum uh, probably about 15 years ago um, because I work behind the scenes in science and dealing with collections but I wanted to make an impact and to and find um, how um, what I work on and the scientific information how it could engage um, the public and education as well um, a, a lot more so I worked within our interpretation team for about a whole year so I took a secondment and I worked on an interesting project that was called the um, humans in the natural world that hasn't actually been realized since 2006 when I worked on that project <laughs> that's probably a briefing doc document but the whole idea you know what we're what we're talking about today so within that that, that briefing document and what I worked on was about, you know, we are all humans in, in this whatever natural nature means to us, but we are part of it. And so currently um, the Natural History Museum has um, a strategy where it, uh, and one of the missions within that is to create advocates for the planet. Um, I mean, some of the stories I told here today is all about that education and engagement. And actually, when I do my tours, I also bring um, samples of the, the cocoa bean and get people to smell it and things like that because you get different sensory. To, so that's all part of the engagement to it. And I have had children on my tour, tour as well. So um, a bit like here today, but... Um, the trouble is you have to get people here and I, I suppose in terms of creating all these activities it, it is changing all the culture within the communities that we are in to then come to things like this and for people to feel part of it. I'm probably not giving any answers but it is small pockets of things that people feel included and what, whatever they eat, whatever they wear is all part of it and it's not just creating an impact here in the UK but it is globally as well. So it's that connection, so you've got to feel connected here and then extending that connection of the impact elsewhere. Um, yeah. This is, this is one of my pet subjects in many ways. Um, we need a fundamental restructuring of our primary and secondary education, frankly, about how the natural world and biodiversity is taught. Um, there's a call, for example, for uh, a new GCSE around our natural history and biodiversity, which would be really, really important. Um, teaching so-called boring subjects such as botany in a completely different way. I'm passionate about botany, but starting off in primary and secondary, for example, about photosynthesis is death for most people. Um, it bored me witless, and I love plants. Um, that connection, sensory, and Miranda touched on it. When I teach people botany, I get them to use their sense of smell, I get their touch. We teach children these days that soil is dangerous, something to be afraid of. It is the very cornerstone of their existence. And simple tools to change your perception about how you look at something. I get people for the first time when I'm talking to, and teaching them about plants to use a hand lens and people go, ooh, wow, and see complexity in the natural world because we're shockers at looking at stuff and going, yeah, I saw a green thing, saw a blue thing, but done. What we need to do is look granularly and slowly. That is so important for us as individuals, but it's also really important for our educational systems. Thank you. I think Judy as well, just on the video link. Yeah, sorry, Ju Judy first. Do you want to, to add to that? I would like very much to emphasize that children spend so many hours at school that outdoor learning as the methodology to teach everything is of vital importance. And teaching and experiencing nature in those early years is what allows children to mo mostly just enjoy nature, make those connections, as well as seeing the connections to all the subjects that they are being taught. So. Outdoor learning, I think, is one of the crucial issues for nature. It actually allows me to say something about what Judy said before, is about social housing. Let's ask the people on the social housing what knowledge they already have rather than impose things, because that happens a lot. But in terms of education, this is controversial. I don't, I'm not worried about educating children. I'm worried about educating the adults who run everything. 
And it's they who need to be educated. And most of the time, if I may say in terms of what the, the committee said for Hammersmith, is we need to change a whole sort of culture of how we do things. Paving, we have to have paving. No, why can't we have soil underneath the paving that stores rainwater that helps the tree? It's called Stockholm, the tree pit method. But there's a culture in all of our councils, I'm in Lewisham, that says, no, that's what we do, that's what we do. We need to educate within our boroughs to say there is a climate emergency and how are we going to address it? Not a five-year-old, a 35-year-old or a 55-year-old or 57-year-old like me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. Um, any other questions out there on the floor? Any, anybody got any burning questions? I've got, I've got another question here, really, which is directed at the council. Um, the question is, what are your tips and recommendations to the local authority to help combat biodiversity loss? How do we stop further loss? And, and are there things that we can do as well as, as local residents? What can we do to stop further biodiversity loss? Does anybody want to give that a go? Yep. Mark, you're not going to like this. No. <laughs> right, okay, Mark. Look. I've been a nature conservationist all my life, and in a city like London, there is loss. I want to change the focus away from loss to creation, because actually, that's what I do in my professional life. I'm creating habitats on space that nobody ever did before, and there's too much of a focus in our cultural uh, understanding of nature that it's all about loss and preservation. How do we create all the council states of Hammersmith to be more biodiverse? And that, that is about creativity within a city. And I'm sure, and I know things suffer in my part of London from loss, but we sometimes need to shift this to creation. Mark, do you want to follow up on that? No, I, could, I couldn't disagree with you. I like exactly what you're saying. Um, I think one of the ways you address you know, loss or how do you develop gain is by knowledge in the first place because in so many cases because of decades of erosion of knowledge and skills in our local authorities there isn't the capacity and the knowledge to understand what is in their space you know being a scientist data 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 information what plants grow where what bats are where what bees are where that cornerstone baseline information about what is in our homes, in our streets, on our council estates. Again, council estates are really, really terribly biased against actually some of the best grassland habitat I know in London, and Dusty was talking about this earlier on, is actually in council estates. But it's looked after really, really badly because it's perceived to be low value. So understanding what you've got already, then you can build on it. Mark, I don't know whether you want to add to anything. I was thinking particularly about Magravine Cemetery. I can't remember who mentioned Magravine, but could you tell us a bit more about the bees at Magravine? Because anybody who goes to Magravine will realise that that is a place that's, that's really quite full of life. Yeah, so Mag Magravine Cemetery is, um, is probably the best site in the borough for, 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 for bees. Um, it's, a, it's an old cemetery. A lot of the cemetery is allowed to, um, the grass is allowed to grow um, long. There's lots of wildflowers and things in there. It's also got some really, really interesting walls. There's some really interesting ferns and things on the walls. I don't know if Mark's been there. It's got some fantastic collections of ferns and things on the walls. And I remember a few years ago, I was asked if I would do some ecology surveys there. And I kind of said, like, well, I can do this, I can do that, but you'll need to get someone else to do all the ferns because. There's, I'm not an expert on ferns, but there's, 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 it's got really impressive ferns and things in the wall. But it's like that, that cemetery's got really, really good ecology. And there's, because the walls are really old and there's lots of nooks and crannies and things growing on the walls, there's lots of places for bees to nest because they like old walls. And it's just, we have a similar situation here. We've got the old, the old walls are full of, especially we get walls that have got decaying lime mortar. They're really good for, for, for bees and things nesting in. But Mark Ryan Cemetery is a good, good place for bees. Um, the species that you've you find there the sort of same species that you find here, the palace, and some of the species that, like the Ashimani bees that nest in the palace grounds, they, they're, they're capable of flying quite far to feed. So you, some of the Ashimani bees that nest here will probably go to Mogravine to, to forage on the trees there because it's only a kilometre or so away. Um, 
It's a similar sort of bees to what you find here, but there's a few other bees there that, that you find that you don't get here, just because it's a large, it's a larger space, and generally in larger spaces you tend to find sort of more species because there's more room for them all to exist. Um, I don't really want to know what I, can, what I can add to the question that was answered because everybody else has already answered it so well. Um, I, I agree with Dusty a lot that um, we need to be looking at creation of habitat, and not just sort of loss. We need to be looking at putting habitats on green roofs, putting green walls in, you know, putting planters on lampposts and all these other spaces. Um, I, I remember recently I was walking through Waterloo, uh, and just behind Waterloo Station, there's a series of residential streets, and what they've done there is they've done exactly what Judy Ling Wong was saying. You know, in between the street trees, they've removed the paving slabs, and they've put in. They're not quite rain gardens. They've, you know, they're not. They're not that well designed. They've just, but they've just literally moved, moved the paving slabs and filled it with some gravelly soil, and they've put lots of drought tolerant plants in there. But what it's doing is it's creating habitat, and it's helping to, you know, reduce the heat island effect. You know, it's, you know, all that, all this kind of thing. And we could be, we could, we could, be, could be doing lots more like that. And I know you've, you've said that. You don't think there's many streets in the borough where we could rip out paving and do big, big things. But I think there actually is. There is. I think there actually is. There actually is. Right, OK. But. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah great. No, that's terrific. It, it's really interesting to point out these precious places. Magravine is one of them, but actually Wormwood Scrubs is another one, um, which is uh, currently being threatened by HS2 in a building site, which is destroying so much of the biodiversity there. It's really quite scary that we allow these things still to happen. So I have to really congratulate um, Fulham Palace for organising a day like this as well, just to kind of highlight the importance of these things. But before we end, I just wanted to ask Miranda, whether there are any secrets behind Fulham Palace and its colonial past. I don't know if you've done any research there, but it's fascinating to kind of dig out the richer history that we're, so many, many of us are kept hidden from. Not, not yet. But not yet. <laughs> <laughs> See what's going on. Oh, great. Um, I don't, don't know all of the secrets yet, but... Um, uh, the Bishop of London owned uh, a lot of land in, in London um, and owned Fulham Palace and a stretch of land all the way to Chiswick in the west, to Chelsea Creek in the east, all the way up to Willesden. Um, and that land had forests on, produced a lot of wealth for the Bishop of London. But the Bishop of London was also uh, so-called Bishop of the Colonies. And so he was the senior church person responsible for the administration and um, the spread of religion in the colonies. Um, so as you can imagine from that, the Bishop of London had... Um, who, who knows, would have had, um, would have been advising on pay rates of uh, the clergy in the Caribbean, uh, in North America, um, and was running, was kind of running the colonial administration from Fulham Palace at one stage. Um, we, I'm sure we will find examples, uh, more examples of how the bishops were involved in the transatlantic slave trade um, and uh, the impact of um, uh, colonialism on the, on the bishop's wealth. Um, bishop Compton, who many of the speakers have spoken about already, um, was a mad plant collector and um, acquired many plants from North America and the Far East. And he actually ordained a priest who was actually a botanist. He ordained him because um, that gave him an excuse to send him to North America via Jamaica to collect plants to bring back to, or to send back to Fulham Palace. Um, so w in our exhibition, we've we, we have talked about how um, the Bishop of London's collector Bannister wasn't a man on his own. He was also reliant on the Native American community and also enslaved Africans to help collect those plants. Um, so there is more to find out, but that's what we know so far. Thank you. That's fascinating. The, um, the other thing I think I really learned today in discussing with the various speakers is about how things are changing. And we, we talk about our knowledge, and there, there's a kind of con conflict here. One is the, what Lucy was saying about using the knowledge we already have. We know how to reuse and, and make the best of, of what we've got already. But then it's applying that knowledge in a new way because things are changing. So when we specify trees, we can't necessarily specify trees that are indigenous because actually the climate is changing around here. So, you know, a birch tree won't survive in the streets anymore because birch trees are moving north. I don't know if anybody wants to add to how, how do we respond to, to or rather than respond, adapt to the changing climate? How, how can we 
grow that knowledge so that we, we keep going um, and learning from it. It's a kind of completely tangential and probably not legitimate response to it. The climate I think we need to adapt to is the economic one. Basically, it's an economic system which is destroying the planet, and that's the thing that we need to change. Now, that's not necessarily on the agenda at the moment, but if we're going to have a chance to survive to the point at which that does become on the agenda, then we're going to have to work much more cooperatively. So rather than thinking in terms of what can we ask the council to do to protect wildlife, or what can we do to protect wildlife, we need to work together. And we've, we've done this quite successfully in Hackney, and it takes years. It takes years partly because building community strength, building community capacity takes a long time, and partly because it takes an awful long time to get a local authority to understand that you're not a nutter who you know, just basically wants to make their life more difficult, or that you know, they're actually the people who are really intransigent and they don't really want to listen to you. And it, it's very difficult, but in reality, the councils are not going to have the money to be able to do a lot of the stuff that we need to be done socially. We need places protected and we need places create, we need habitat created. And the best way to do that is for us to work cooperatively where the right people who know stuff talk to the right people who can do stuff, who can persuade the people who might stop stuff from happening to not stop stuff from happening. And it, you know, it's, it, it's actually quite simple when you put it all together, but it's incredibly complex to get it done. So you need to stop the planning officers trashing things because they're under pressure from corporate interests. You need to give power and encouragement to the tree officers, to the ecologists within the local authority who want to do the right thing but got no resources to do it. And you need to give a power to the communities and an absolutely fantastic talk um, from Katie in terms of we can all contribute. It's a big learning curve and it's a big opportunity. But it's all about us working together. If you don't know someone else does, just try and find the right person. And the chances are that person might be really busy, might be run off their feet because they're desperately trying to protect loads of other stuff. But they want to work with you because they know you will increase their capacity to do it. So um, I don't think I said anything about the question that you just asked me. But <laughs> that's part of the solution. But you said what needed to be said. Mark, do you want to talk about adaptation? Several of the speakers have touched on the issue of climate, climate change and the need to adapt to climate change in their talks. And I think one of the things that we really need to be looking at in terms of pollinators is we need to be looking at what things we can plant that, that flower, naturally flower early, in, that would flower early in the air and can provide food for pollinators that are waking up ever more earlier in the season because the, the, it's warmer. And we've got a big problem with a lot of, plant, a lot of plants um, will flower earlier because it's warm and it's sunny but a lot of plants also don't start flowering until they've had the right amount of solar exposure they're not they don't flower because it's warm they flower because it's the length of daylight and the length of daylight isn't changing that's the same you know unless something knocks or knocks, knocks the earth off its axis and the, you know the orbit changes or something it's going to stay the same but the temperature is a big problem because we've seen in the last few years ridiculous 20 odd degree celsius weather in february and we've seen bees emerging in february that wouldn't normally emerge till april and they're the plants that they depend on for food aren't out yet so i think part one of the things that we need to be looking at with climate change adaptation is what things can we plant earlier to provide for pollinators that are waking up from hibernation early and early and early every year um, and i think we also need to be looking at um, continuity of planting throughout the season as well because what we've had in recent years with we've had very very mild early very hot warm springs and then we've had drought until late summer and we've actually had we're having what the bees are experiencing is they're starting experiencing these dearths in late spring through summer until the autumn when we're getting rains because we've been the last few years we've had we've had the three hottest consecutive summers on record we've had heat waves from well, we've had two, two or three years, we've had no rain in April, May, June, July, and then August we get torrential flooding and downpours of rain. And that's a really big problem for pollinators because those are key months when most of our pollinators are active. And if you've got drought conditions, they can't get enough pollen and extra feed. So we need to be thinking about things that we can plant that can talk, cope with these drought conditions and thinking about planting uh, plants that provide a succession of forage for pollinators throughout the whole year as well. And I think, I think people like Russell and Mark are probably the people to be picking 
p picking the brains of and f asking what what things should we be planting that match that need. I just one quick thing on the the uh, mitigation thing is that again our perceptions of change are blurred through our what we see and how we record the natural world. So. Um, and things are changing exceptionally rapidly. I think this is one of the really important things. This isn't abstract. It's fundamental and very, very fast. So there's a British native plant called early meadow grass, which um, up until about 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, was only found in the far southwest of Britain, in Lizard uh, and in the Isles of Scilly. Over the last 20 or so years, it has moved along the south coast and then has moved north. It was first found in Greater London in 2004. This plant has moved hundreds of miles and massively increased its population and is now, you know, as far as sort of Warwick and probably even further, I think it's actually probably got up as far as uh, Manchester and maybe even Edinburgh. The range change of our wild plants and other animals such as bees has been enormous and therefore our response in terms of mitigation is going to have to be enormous because as mark referenced you know it's not just change in temperature it's daylight it's water availability the challenges of finding the right plants to support pollinators are enormous but we're going to have to start doing it very very rapidly this is not a even a in a five years time this is a this year is incredibly urgent Okay, and I think uh, Judy on the video link might want to add to this as well. Thank you. As we can see from this session, there's terrific technical specialties and expertise all over the place. The thing we really need is to connect ordinary people en masse to doing these things. And one of the good examples is London National Park City. It is connecting people on the ground, especially newcomers, to all kinds of things to do. And once people are interested, they simply want to know more. And all these connections have got to grow to create a movement that has substantial impact for the climate, for biodiversity, and for benefits to people. So let, let us use this terrific platform of London National Park City. If you look on their website and so on, there's terrific information, there's stimulus to newcomers to visit places and so on. So all of your speakers here should really feature there. Write blogs, give information, interest people, connect people with enjoyment and create a real movement that makes a difference. questions out there I think it's been a fascinating session and I think that last point about Medigas you know it, it's it's one species but we can all find something that captures our imagination that makes us realize what's going on and how we have to do things differently so I'm going to wrap up and perhaps say thank you I'll hand back to Sean who can who can say thank you Well, thank you very much to all of our fantastic speakers, to Lucy, to Mark, to Miranda, to Dusty, to Katie, to Mark, um, and to Russell, and to Judy, who's been online, and also to Paul Beatty Panel for chairing that last Q&A session. I'm sure that we could probably stay for a lot longer debating matters, um, but it's definitely getting a bit cold. Um, so I'm sure that everyone wants to wrap up. But yeah, I, I really appreciate all the time that the speakers have given. And thanks to the online audience and the audience here for, for joining us. And um, hopefully this is just the first of, of annual green meets. And we can think about what our focus for discussion might be next year. So thank you very much. <laughs>